I, I, I just, uh, I don't have words to say how much we thank you. In particular, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jorge and, and Gerardo for their support. They have been behind this project from the very beginning. Uh, I would like to thank the scientific committee, in particular, Shanshal and Rafa, that also have been a great and incredible support for us, as well as all, all other members of, of the committee. Uh, Xavier, I, I'm not sure that he's around, but I will thank him uh, very much too. Uh, and then I, I was giving a look to the program. It's incredibly good. Uh, it's, it's, it's also good that my, the first speaker is a friend of mine. Uh, hi, Chris, a, a pleasure to see you there. Uh, then uh, nothing else to say. Then uh, thank you all. Welcome to, to the uh, Ninth Reach Forum and uh, have a, an incredible good uh, conference. Thank you very much, Omar. I would like to join your, your words and, and, and thanks, Rich. Thanks also the IDB for the support. Uh, thank the scientific committee, uh, um, Javier Frexas, Donato Marquandaro, uh, Vicky Landaberry, and especially Rafa and Shanshao for all your support and for being here, for coming from long, <laughs> far away. And of course, also, uh, our keynotes, Rafa, and especially Helen Ray, for doing the trip uh, to Uruguay. Finally, after uh, several years, we are really happy you are you are here with us. So thank you very much, indeed. Also to all the authors, uh, contributors, thank you for your interest in in, in this uh, workshop. Um, to the supporting staff uh, that uh, make this uh, possible, working very very hard. And well, uh, we think we have ensembled an interesting uh, program on topical issues. Uh, and so let's start with it. Let's start with the first session. But before that, let me remember a little bit the rules of the game, which are pretty simple. The first rule is to enjoy and to make this a uh, fruitful uh, workshop. And in, in, in order to do that, uh, I propose 50 minutes total for total presentation of each paper, uh, meaning 35 minutes for presentation and around 15 minutes for uh, exchange, uh, question and answers. Uh, so let me invite uh, Christophe Bench from the um, Service Risk uh, Ban Research Division to talk about this uh, very hot topic, I would say, which is stablecoin adoption and fragility. Christophe. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for including my paper in this program. It's a great pleasure to, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, hi, Omar. Sorry that we uh, can't meet in person. Um, I think you, you have to put the slides on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, what I will present today is a applied theory paper on stable coins that aims to analyze the determinants of stable coin adoption and fragility. The avenue that I take in this paper is to build on the existing literature on bank runs and currency attacks, trying to take specific features of the stablecoins market into account. So what are stablecoins? Stablecoins are the latest innovation in the history of private money. Uh, they promise crypto investors a stable and secure way to park their funds in the crypto universe and they are used by crypto investors to reduce their trading costs across cryptocurrency exchanges. More recently, um, uh, they are also used for uh, low-cost remittance payments, and there might be other use cases going forward. Stable coins live on a blockchain, uh, but different to the highly volatile crypto assets like Bitcoin, stable coins um, are packed to a fiat currency, primarily to the US dollar, uh, and the leading stable coins are backed by traditional financial assets. So this feature makes the stable coins quite similar to a Monero bank or a money market mutual fund, uh, with similar vulnerabilities to runs because coin holders are sensitive to uh, adverse information about the issuer. Um, in the next slide, 
I knew I have to point in this direction, but yeah, now it works. Okay, in the next slide, uh, you can see uh, uh, how this market looks like. So it was growing rapidly since 2000. Uh, this is the uh, market capitalization of the top stable coins and billions of US dollars here. All of the stable coins are packed to the US dollar. Uh, and uh, the timeline is from January 2020 uh, to the end of November. Uh, you can see that the market was growing almost fivefold in uh, 2021. Uh, then there has been a significant market correction in May, where a smaller uh, um, stablecoin Terra US dollar failed. Uh, that's what you can see here, the red dotted line. You can see that the uh, market is quite concentrated. The uh, uh, largest stablecoin Tether has at the moment a market capitalization of around 65 billion US dollars. That's the blue line. Uh, the second biggest is US dollar coin uh, with around 45 billion US dollar market capitalization, and then Binance coin with a bit more than 20 billion. Let me try to uh, uh, give you a little bit more information about the balance sheet. Okay, here we are. Uh, about the balance sheet of the uh, largest stable coin, Tether, uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea what the coin holders should be concerned about the type of risks that they are facing. For them, it's clear that they may not always be able to redeem their coins at par. Uh, there's asset return risk, liquidity risks, and also custodial risk. Moreover, there's other operational risks and technological risks. Think, for instance, of cyber attacks. Uh, what you can see here is the uh, asset breakdown of uh, Tether, the uh, leading stablecoin, from the uh, end of the second quarter 2022. You can see that uh, they are holding all sorts of assets that are backing the stablecoin. Some of them are quite risky, and I used some uh, rough color coding uh, to illustrate where the biggest risks uh, are. So uh, there is uh, uh, corporate bonds, um, there is uh, secured loans, there is uh, also cash and bank deposits with uh, uh, non-US uh, regulated financial institutions. Um, uh, from what we know, it's uh, primarily Chinese banks. And there's also commercial paper holdings, some of which uh, are in more uh, risky rating categories. So we can see here from the viewpoint of coin holders, there's something to be concerned about. Um, what are the key research questions that I'm trying to address in my theoretical framework? First, how is stablecoin fragility affected by adoption? What determines the interplay between the two, between fragility and adoption? Second, what is the role of payment preferences, crypto investor heterogeneity, network effects, transaction costs, operational costs, and recent phenomena such as stablecoin lending? Third, how are adoption and fragility affected by uh, monetary policy, competition with the traditional banking sector? Or what if the issuer faces a moral hazard problem? That's something that regulators are quite concerned about. And fifth, what are the implications from all that for financial regulation going forward? Um, let me uh, briefly say that uh, uh, there is a lot of related literature that I build on. Uh, I will develop a global games framework that is adopted to the uh, stablecoin market setting. And uh, there is a large literature that has uh, developed uh, global games frameworks to study bank runs and currency attacks. George Arles, among others, has worked on that. Um, moreover, my paper also uh, relates to recent uh, literature on the adoption of different means of payments. There are also other recent papers on stable coins. They look at different issues, such as uh, uh, aspects related to the stabilization mechanisms and smart contracts. Uh, what I do, the paper I will develop here, is in a way complement complementary to those papers, and it's most applicable for the leading fully backed stable coins, whereas those papers are more interesting uh, if you uh, like to learn more about the uh, algorithmic stable coins. Uh, so let's come to the setup of the baseline model. Uh, there are three dates and a unit continuum of risk inflations. Each agent is endowed with one unit of cash at the beginning of time. At date zero, there is an adoption game. Uh, where the agents decide whether to hold stable coins, whether to adopt stable coins. 
to do so, they have to convert the cash into stable coins. No? Uh, or whether to uh, uh, place that cash with insured deposits. Uh, they are uh, preferring insured deposits uh, over cash whenever the deposit rate is larger than one. Um, at date one, there is a conversion game. And that's modeled as a global game of regime change. Um, each coin holder uh, is with the probability of an active coin holder and participates in this conversion game. Uh, then she decides whether to reallocate her funds at date one, uh, meaning whether to demand conversion into cash or not. Uh, instead, the fraction one minus half are passive coin holders and they are just dormant till the end of day two. Uh, Kappa could be one, uh, but I uh, focus in this baseline model on situations where uh, Kappa is sufficiently small, um, such that there is no rationing at date one, and I will tell you later more uh, uh, what simplifications that gives in our model. Um, there are three key features that I would like to highlight. Two of these features have to do with the uh, key innovation in this paper, and the third feature is standard in the global game literature. The first feature is uh, that I assume that agents consume only at day two, but they are uncertain about the preferred mean of payment. Specifically, uh, I assume that uh, each agent uh, is randomly matched with the seller of the consumption good, and they know that the seller of the consumption good is only accepting payment in stable coins with probability alpha g payment with a deposit, so with a bank transfer, with probability beta G, and they are indifferent. They accept both means of payment with probability one minus alpha G minus beta G. Uh, that matters because they are fixed cost of conversion. For simplicity, I, for simplicity, I abstract from the fixed cost at date zero for, uh, without loss of generality. Uh, tau one is the fixed cost. Uh, for conversion at date one. So that's what you have to pay if you want to convert stable coins to cash, or vice versa. And tau two is the stable uh, is, is the fixed cost at day two. Um, the uh, conversion costs uh, are in this model exogenous and they are meant to capture fees for on-chain or off-chain transactions, uh, but also convenience costs that are perhaps incurred by the agent when they uh, uh, do a conversion. In an extension of the model, I allow uh, the stablecoin issuer to capture part of the revenue from uh, the transaction fees, but in the baseline model, they don't have any income from this transaction fees. Uh, the second key feature is that agents are heterogeneous in the alpha cheese and the beta cheese. And I will tell you more about that in the next slide. The third feature is centered in the global gains literature. I assume that the stablecoin issuer uh, has a return that's stochastic and that's covered by a fundamental theta and there's incomplete information about it. So agents can't observe directly the realization of the fundamental, but they get a noisy signal. So there are two dimensions of heterogeneity. First, about the payment preference. And the way I model this is I assume that there is a, uh, potentially large number capital G of groups of agents indexed by a uh, small g uh, with measure mg where the uh, uh, mass sums up to one um, when we sum over the groups. Uh, I assume that uh, the uh, groups differ in their gamma g where gamma g is ent entering additively uh, the alphas and the betas. So uh, what does that mean here? Uh, alpha G is the probability to meet a seller that is only accepting stable coins. And that has a common combo component, alpha N, and a group specific component, gamma G. Um, so if you're belonging to a group with a larger gamma G, then you're more likely to meet a seller at the end of the game that has a preference for payment in stable coins and less likely to meet a seller that has a preference for a bank transfer. Um, so agents belonging to group with a higher gamma G have a higher perceived attractiveness of stable coins as the preferred means of payment. So that's in a way like an induced preference for stable coins vis-a-vis -vis, uh, bank transfers. 
the yeah. center of the same as the bias or there are uh, different groups? There are different agents. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so, so the sellers are, are different agents. They they only are there at day two. They are the guys who provide the consumption goods, um, and uh, they have a payment preference. And that matters for the coin holders or for, for the agents because uh, they face transaction costs if they don't have the right mean of payment at the end of the game, right? And uh, in a way, when when thinking about that, uh, uh, when taking a step back for the model. Uh, uh, I think that heterogeneity is quite important uh, among crypto agents. Uh, it's influenced by preferences such as the law for anonymity, by convenience of payment methods for uh, uh, certain use cases and uh, certain transaction cost advantages that they have in, in, in the kind of trades they do. And the parameter gamma is uh, trying to capture this heterogeneity. So if you like agents with a higher gamma, with a higher probability to meet a seller that has a preference for stable coins are the crypto enthusiasts in a way in my model. Yeah. Yes. You are meeting a seller, and uh, yes. So, so you have your coins or your deposits. Yeah. What price are you going to be buying? Yeah, in fiat, in fiat. Yeah. So, 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 so uh, we will see that um, if uh, your stable coins are devalued because the uh, issuer becomes insolvent, then uh, uh, you can obtain only less consumption goods because consumption goods are up priced basically in fiat. This price is exogenous. Yes, exogenous exactly. Yeah. Questions. So at, at day zero, at the adoption yeah. stage, uh, the adopt they, they know they are informed about this potential uncertainty. Exactly, exactly. So this can they, they, they form the right expectations about that. Yeah, they are all rational and 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 they know all that. Yeah. Uh, so the the, the second uh, dimension of uh, heterogeneity is about the information, and that's the uh, a standard global games assumption. So I assume that the active coin holders they receive a private signal XI, which comprises uh, the fundamental realization theta that they can't observe plus some idiosyncratic noise term. This noise term is uh, uh, uniformly distributed. And uh, the uh, uh, GI, so the uh, groups uh, and the noise terms are uncorrelated. That's an assumption that I could relax, but uh, uh, that's what we stick with for the baseline model. Uh, let me tell you something uh, uh, about the stablecoin issuer. Uh, the stablecoin issuer uh, offers to convert cash into digital tokens, so stablecoins and vice versa at a one-to-one -one conversion rate at each date. Uh, of course, there are this exogenous transaction costs. Um, investments in the stablecoins are risky. Everybody knows about it. And the issuer may not always be able to keep her promise for the one-to-one -one conversion. Um, the issuer collects the funds at date zero and makes a uh, risky investment. Uh, that pays off theta units of cash at day two, a unit invested, where uh, uh, theta uh, follows again a uniform distribution. Importantly, the uh, theta lower bound, uh, uh, theta lower bar is below one. So there's going to be cases when the issuer can't meet the promise, and theta upper bar is uh, above one. Uh, in addition, similar to the uh, bank run literature, there is uh, a uh, um, cost for divesting prematurely. So premature liquidation uh, yields uh, little r, which is small or equal to theta lower bar. And in addition, I assume that there is uh, some bankruptcy cost. So if the issuer can't meet her promise, uh, there is an additional bankruptcy cost that reduces the uh, residual value available to be dispersed. Um, to the remaining coin holders. Uh, so for the time being, uh, this uh, risky investment uh, is just uh, exogenous. In an extension, I look at a more hazard problem where the risk choice is uh, endogenized. Uh, we have to solve the model backwards. So let's first have to have a look at the conversion game at uh, date one. Um, at the conversion game, we have a situation where the active coin holders, they receive their private signal XI uh, that's correlated with the uh, issuer's fundamental theta, and they uh, simultaneously decide whether to keep their stable coins or instead demand conversion to one unit of cash. 
the action uh, zero is to keep the stable coins and the action one is to demand conversion. Uh, and we're gonna see that the um, active coin holders that receive a variable, a very favorable signal, so that receive a XI that is large above a certain threshold are gonna be the ones that are keeping the stable coins and the agents who receive an unfavorable signal uh, that is a low XI below the threshold, they're gonna be the ones that demand conversion in equilibrium. Uh, what's the decision problem of the active coin holders? They ask themselves two key questions. First, how good is the issuer's fundamental theta given my private signal XI? And second, what is the proportion A, the aggregate demand, uh, the proportion of active coin holders demanding conversion? So the aggregate demand here is nothing else than the integral over the individual uh, actions uh, divided by uh, the mass of active coin holders, which is the fraction kappa times n, where n is the adoption rate. So n is the uh, mass of the agents uh, adopting the stable coin, and the uh, kappa is the fraction of active coin holders. And the n is going to be solved for in the adoption game. So in the conversion game, it's taken as given. Um, so uh, as I told you, they, they have to be concerned about uh, a solvency given the private signal uh, they receive. Uh, so when is the issuer insolvent? Uh, the issuer is insolvent uh, if she's unable to meet her day two payment obligation. Uh, and here it's important uh, that I assume that uh, Kappa is um, smaller than one. Because if Kappa were one, it could also be that the uh, issuer is cash flow insolvent at date one. That would complicate the problem. I have a robustness section on that, uh, not much additional insight. The model becomes much less tractable. So when Kappa is uh, sufficiently small, then uh, we have a situation where the issuer can only be cash flow insolvent at day two. Uh, what you have on the left hand side of this inequality is the payment obligation that's uh, comprising the uh, fraction kappa of active investors um, who uh, didn't withdraw, uh, who didn't demand conversion at day one, plus the uh, one minus kappa, that's the fraction of dormant investors. They all have a claim on one unit of cash. That's the one to a one conversion promise, right? And on the uh, right-hand side, we see basically the uh, uh, residual value uh, uh, um, of the assets uh, by the issuer, held by the issuer. Um, if we isolate A uh, in this inequality, we can define a critical threshold A hat such that the issuer is insolvent whenever the aggregate demand Conversion demand A is below A hat. That's the first column here. Uh, then the issue is solvent. And whenever the aggregate uh, demand A is larger than the threshold, uh, the issue is unable to meet all the redemption requests and is insolvent. So what are the uh, payoffs for the actions whether to demand or not to demand conversion? So if you choose the action one, uh, you demand conversion and the issue is uh, solvent then you receive one unit of cash as promised. You incur the transaction cost, tau one, because you demand conversion at day one. Moreover, you know that with a certain probability at day two, you're going to meet the seller with a preference for payment in stablecoin. So you have to convert back to stablecoin, which uh, means you have to incur the cost, tau two, with a probability alpha G. Um, if the issue is insolvent, um, you, you receive the same if you demand conversion. Instead, if you keep your coins, then uh, if the issue is solvent, you also receive one as promised, uh, but you have a potential transaction cost, which occurs with probability beta, and that's if you meet a seller that has a preference for bank payments, because then you have to convert your stable coins into bank uh, deposits, which comes at the cost of tau two, right? Uh, what is important is if you keep your coins and the issue is insolvent, you get less. Um, if the issue is insolvent, then what you get depends on the residual value. Uh, that's the first term here left in the bank minus the bankruptcy cost psi um, divided by uh, the proportion of, action, uh, of coin holders that are remaining. Um, minus again the second term, uh, some uh, uh, transaction costs in case 
you uh, uh, meet a seller that has a preference for bank transfers because then you have to convert your devalued coins into bank deposits. Uh, so what we can do is we can construct the uh, differential payoff from demanding conversion, and that's basically what I do here graphically. And we can see that uh, the benefit from demanding conversion is going to be negative. If A is small, if the issue is solvent, then it's better uh, not to demand conversion. Why is that the case? It's negative because otherwise you wouldn't have wanted to uh, uh, place your funds in the stable coins in the first place. You wouldn't have wanted to adopt it. Uh, if you would certainly want to withdraw already at date one. Uh, the second point to mention is that uh, for higher levels of conversion demand A, we have that the benefit from demanding turns positive and is increasing in A, so there's a strategic complementarity in actions. Uh, if we now look at the continuation equilibrium at date one, for a given adoption rate N, uh, we have the following result. Uh, given assumption one, and I come back to this later, uh, and uh, for the case of vanishing private lawyers, so sigma uh, uh, is going to zero in the limit, uh, and for a given positive level of adoption rate, we have that there exists a unique monotone equilibrium of the conversion game where active coin holders demand conversion if and only if they receive a private signal below a certain group-specific signal threshold, uh, X star, and where the uh, issue of faces a run for all fundamental realization of theta below a threshold theta star, where theta star is given uh, implicitly by this uh, equation that you can see here. Um, so um, when constructing this difference conditions, we are uh, uh, using the uh, belief constraint of a paper in, uh, in Sakovic and Steiner, uh, because for the case of vanishing private lawyers, the uh, problem uh, simplifies a lot because all these group specific thresholds, the group specific X stars are clustering around the fundamental threshold. And we can just average over the group specific indifference conditions. And this is something that you can see uh, in this uh, gamma upper bar term that is uh, uh, playing a key role in this equation here. So this gamma upper bar is in a way some averaging, some weighted averaging over all the group specific in different conditions. So the group specific levels of gammas here you can see uh, in this averaging here. Um, so here it's gonna uh, uh, play a role um, what the average uh, induced preference uh, for stable coins vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, bank deposits is going to be. And that is linking adoption then also to fragility here in our model, but more on that later. Uh, regarding the assumption one, the uh, first two conditions are quite standard. They ensure that we have an upper and lower dominance region. Um, the uh, condition on kappa I already uh, uh, told you about. And uh, the last condition is about the bankruptcy costs. So we are basically bounding the bankruptcy in a cost such that uh, the uh, um, residual payoff in the bank uh, doesn't turn negative. Um, and uh, we um, also don't want to have a situation where uh, individual uh, investors never want to demand conversion, even if they know that the stable coin is with probability one and solvent. So we, in a way, rule out unrealistic, uh, implausible cases here. Uh, let's come to the more interesting part, which is the comparative statics. Uh, and that's uh, uh, the most interesting results of proposition three that I list here. Um, we find that the incidence of stable coin runs is decreasing. Uh, in the common component of the seller's preference for coin payments, that is in the alpha N. Um, what I didn't tell you before is that this common component uh, can actually be a function of N. If it's a function of N, then there's a positive network effect in here. And that's something that I will uh, uh, introduce later. Yeah. Incidence of stable, but what does it mean? The incidence of runs, the probability, the probability, the, the probability of runs, yeah, the probability of uh, uh, insolvency uh, of the issue, yeah. Um, so, so second, uh, uh, this probability of runs also uh, decreases in the uh, 
average relative preference for coin payments among the stable coin adopters. So in this average gamma in the population of coin holders. Uh, it's also decreasing in the transaction cost R1, which in a way is interesting because we know that in this crypto markets, uh, the transaction costs go up a lot. Uh, if uh, there is a high transaction volume within a short time window on, on the blockchain. And that's in a way a stabilizing factor, uh, factor built in. Um, but that's from what we know in the literature, not very surprising. Um, and uh, I mean, you can go to like swing pricing for money market funds and all sorts of things here. So, so there are uh, uh, analogies here. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, the uh, probability of runs uh, is also decreasing in the uh, liquidation value um, of the issuer. Uh, moreover, we find that the uh, incidence of uh, runs, uh, the probability of runs is increasing uh, in the bankruptcy cost, that's also quite intuitive, and also in the fraction of active coin holders, which are increasing, which are increasing the uh, redemption pressure. Um, and that's, of course, also associated with a higher probability of insolvency. Um, next, if we try to link fragility and adoption, we can find the pop following. We can find that the probability of runs is increasing in the adoption rate um, if this destabilizing effect from new adopters that are belonging to groups with a lower gamma G and are driving down the average gamma it's not outweighed by uh, positive network effects. And here, basically, we uh, uh, come back to this uh, um, alpha as a function of n, the common component of the payment preference uh, can be a, a function of adoption if there are positive network effects. Uh, we would expect that uh, the first derivative of alpha is positive. Uh, and uh, uh, if this uh, network externality is sufficiently strong, we're going to have that higher adoption is stabilizing. But if that's not the case, higher adoption is going to be destabilizing in this model. And the in intuition is if you're uh, uh, attracting broader market segments, the marginal coin holder is going to be more flighty, and that's going to translate into a higher probability of runs in this model. So uh, a gamma bar would be the, the, the average over the gamma cheese weighted by the uh, uh, um, uh, population fractions here. And um, uh, if you're basically uh, tapping uh, into market segments that are more flighty, then the average gamma is going to be reduced, and that makes the stable coin less stable. Uh, then we come to the adoption game at date zero. Uh, in the adoption game, the uh, agents, they uh, belong to different groups, they have one unit of cash, and they simultaneously decide uh, whether to um, uh, place this one unit of cash with the stablecoin issuer as the action one, or to go for uh, insured bank deposits that's the action zero. Uh, when solving this uh, uh, problem, the agents ask themselves two questions. Uh, first, how likely is it that deposits or stable coins are the preferred payment method by the seller at day two? And second, how high is the fragility of the stable coin issuer? Because that's also something I care about. Uh, it's going to be the case that uh, uh, there's going to be also a threshold on the gammas. So the agents that belong to a group with a high gamma, so the crypto enthusiasts in a way, they are more likely to, this, uh, to adopt the stable coins and the ones uh, that belong to the uh, low gammas thing, for instance, uh, of uh, uh, somebody who doesn't have a technological affinity and really uh, is very risk averse, just goes for bank deposits. That's the guys with the low gamma, uh, and they are not going to adopt a stable coin, right? Uh, then if we uh, again try to link uh, this time adoption to fragility the other way around, uh, we find that the adoption rate and that is solving the adoption game is negatively associated with the belief of agents about the issuer's fragility. So not surprisingly, if the agents believe that uh, the issue is more fragile, if it's more likely that there is a stablecoin run, uh, then they are less likely to adopt the stablecoin, not surprisingly. Uh, we find that there exists a unique solution to this adoption game. Uh, whenever this network effect is not too strong, if this positive network effect is uh, very strong, then uh, there can be multiple solutions to the adoption game. 
And that's also not surprising. We have seen that in other global games, for instance, where you put some uh, uh, information acquisition at date zero, then you can also get the multiplicity coming back. And it's basically the same thing here. Uh, let me try to uh, show you briefly uh, uh, two of the most interesting extensions of the model in the time that remains. Uh, the first one is on uh, stable coin lending. The second one is going to be on mall hazard and transparency. So when I introduce stable coin lending in an extension, I do it as follows. I introduce uh, a stable coin lending stage in between the adoption game at date zero and the conversion game at date one. And I assume that there is uh, one stable coin borrower, a large borrower, who wants to uh, have uh, uh, Delta coins, uh, who wants to borrow Delta coins and makes a take it or leave it offer to the coin holders before the conversion game. So in between the adoption game and the conversion game. Moreover, I assume that there's a certain probability that the borrower is actually a speculator, that the borrower has a speculative motive and wants to demand conversion prior to the conversion game. And in that way, uh, the uh, speculator is going to harm uh, the remaining coin holders. If instead, with probability one minus Q, the borrower doesn't have the speculative motive, um, then the coin holders are not going to be harmed. And they're going to be, uh, they're going to form rational expectations about that. And the way I model this is similar as in a global games paper by Corsetti and co authors, where they look at a large speculator uh, uh, and the papers that title does Soros uh, make a difference. And uh, the way I model it is, is, is quite similar. The key difference is that in, in their paper, the speculator also receives some private signal uh, correlated with the fundamental realization. Uh, in my case, the uh, borrower is acting uh, 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 without receiving private signal. So when you see what the, what the uh, stablecoin borrower is doing, you don't learn anything about the fundamental in my model. But apart from that, it's quite similar to that paper, if you know it. So um, a key assumption is that the borrower is unconstrained. So uh, the borrower can always uh, uh, keep the promise to give you back the coins that he promised to give you back. Uh, and that could be implemented with smart contracts. However, the value of the coins is not certain. So the coins might be devalued. But you're sure that you're getting back the coins that you were promised. That's the assumption I use in the model. And I think it's the realistic assumption. Uh, the key result is that uh, stablecoin lending is promoting stability and adoption as long as the benefits uh, are not undermined by speculation. So if this probability Q that the borrower is having a speculative motive is becoming too big, then uh, of course, stablecoin lending is uh, demoting stability and adoption. Yeah. Is stablecoin lending, I mean, uh, these borrowers are the agents that you have at the very beginning. Uh, that, that's an external agent. It's a, like one external agent, a large borrower. Okay, right. And and and, but from the perspective of the stablecoin issuer, I mean, you would issue additional coins, and then on the asset side, you would have this loan to this uh, borrower, right? So wh why why uh, so, take make a take it or leave it offer to coin holders as opposed to just uh, lend? points to this uh, outside agent. So, so, so here, um, uh, so here in, the, in this case, uh, the, the, uh, the um, large borrower is uh, uh, borrowing the coins from, from the agents, uh, not from the issuer. And um, she uh, is making a take, take it or leave it offering, uh, take, it, take it or leave it offer. And uh, uh, she's offering, uh, uh, some return for that. So uh, there's going to be a positive uh, lending rate, stablecoin lending rate. And um, if uh, the issue, uh, if the uh, borrower is then um, uh, at day two uh, returning as promised uh, the stablecoins plus interest uh, to the ones who were lending, uh, then of course she has to return uh, more stablecoins than she borrowed. So she has to go to the issuer and she's giving to the issue of fiat in order to obtain uh, the stable coins that she needs in order to uh, keep her promise. And here, this assumption that she's unconstrained is in a way relevant because she has to use cash to convert into stable coins. 
So that's the way it's modeled. Uh, so she can always uh, um, uh, pay back uh, the coins as promised with interest, but the value of the coins might be less. Um, what are you trying to capture with this extension? I mean, it's not clear to me that. Uh... So, so stablecoin lending is a stablecoin lending is a recent phenomenon. It started to boom a lot in the end of last year, and uh, stablecoin lending is typically uh, typically the issuer is is not really involved in that for the for, for the leading stablecoins, but it's um, financial intermediaries um, that are basically uh, engaged into that. So, so it has been a booming market, and there is some uh, demand for this. So uh, um, uh, what I assume implicitly here in this model is that uh, uh, the large borrower, uh, even if it's not a speculator, if, if it has a, a non-speculative motive, has some extra benefit of obtaining the stable coins. And uh, that might be for liquidity reasons or other reasons. And uh, I myself don't understand well enough what the underlying reasons of most of the um, uh, borrowers are in the market, but there are clearly some some rationales why they uh, would want to do that and would want to offer return uh, to the lenders. Then the, the other extension is about uh, transparency and moral hazard. Uh, so here I uh, introduce a, 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 a risk shifting problem. Uh, the issuer now can uh, uh, decide whether to go for a safer, safer or more risky profile. So the distributions of the theta is going to be uh, affected. There's two different distributions that the issuer can choose, a safer, a safer and a riskier one. Both are in a way risky, but one is more risky than the other, right? Um, and uh, then I look at the case uh, with and without commitment. So if um, the... Um, uh, issuer uh, cannot make a credible announcement of the uh, uh, portfolio risk choice. Um, if she cannot commit, then uh, there uh, is a uh, the outcome is always going to be that uh, she's choosing the uh, um, risky portfolio. And uh, here, in terms of regulation, uh, uh, a uh, more transparency could help. So, if the regulator can find a way to uh, implement a credible disclosure regime that helps the issuer uh, to credibly announce her portfolio choice, uh, then of course you can improve on the outcome. Uh, but that may not be enough. Uh, so even uh, when I solve the model for the uh, um, case when the issuer can commit, I find that there could, can be a misalignment between the privately and the socially optimal portfolio choice uh, as long as there is not enough skin in the game, and this gives uh, immediate uh, additional implications for regulations, more heavy-handed uh, implications in terms of measures that limit the riskiness of the issuer's reserve and assure um, uh, um, adequate capitalization of the issuer. Uh, to conclude, uh, the market for stable coins has expanded rapidly. It's prone to instability, uh, and it may po pose broader financial stability risks going forward, uh, especially because there's empirically uh, a link that is showing up between uh, uh, large redemption volumes uh, in the stablecoin markets uh, and effects on the money market and commercial paper market in the US. Uh, existing theories uh, are there to study bank runs and currency attacks. Uh, I try to modify these existing theories to incorporate some of the features that are relevant in this market, such as payment preferences, combined with the stablecoin adoption game. Uh, and in doing so, I try to study the determinants of stablecoin adoption and fragility. Uh, the paper has various extensions. I showed you two of them, and also a set of new testable implications that could be brought to the data. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Christophe, for your presentation in this uh, topical issue. So we have uh, time for uh, questions. Uh, please use the microphone. Start with the last one. Uh, thank you for interesting presentation. I have two questions. So the first one, if I understood correctly, in the adoption phase, uh, you just go 
the result will be like a corner solution. Either, either you go in the stable coins or deposit. And the question, do you have any intuition what might happen if you allow for a combination of both? Because having the deposit insurance will answer some preference for cash from uh, the sellers. And the second question, maybe it's a bit more, more, more fundamental. So uh, you have these two sources of uncertainty. Now, one with respect to the fundamentals of the insurer, the other one with respect to the preferences of the seller. I didn't quite understand which one dominates because you have this strategic complementarity game or a la global games in which the incentive of any agent to take a given action increases with the number of agents given uh, that will take that action. But on the other hand, these preferences of the sellers are fixed. You have only uncertainty. So if, let's say the preference is for cash, even though everyone wants to keep stable coins, for you, it doesn't make sense because you cannot pay. I couldn't understand how these two are put together. Which one dominates? Preference of the sellers or uncertainty regarding the fundamentals of the insurer? Mm -hmm. um... So your first question was about uh, about the mix, allowing for ah, the okay. so, deposit and stable. And then that's a good question. So so uh, uh, here it's it's optimal to to uh, go for either one or the other, and it depends on 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 the induced preference on the group you're in, what what you do, uh, and uh, that's because uh, I assume there is this uh, fixed cost for conversion. If there are proportional costs. Uh, you could uh, uh, get something like you think about. I didn't think about it carefully enough to really uh, say what would happen. And, and, and so I wouldn't be confident in, in saying that all the results are robust. And yeah, so um, I would need to think about that. But that is a good question. And uh, the uh, second point, well, you, you know, if we are kind of going back to uh, this, um, if I can, I don't know. So I showed you this uh, this figure where there is the uh, differ differential payoff from demanding conversion. And uh, well, the uh, graph I showed you, this uh, uh, benefit from demanding conversion is actually group specific. So depending on the group here, you, you will, uh, you know, this, this graph is specific, uh, it changes with the, the group you belong to, you know? So this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, functions shifting up and down depending on which uh, group you belong to. So, so, so the things are collect, connected, and they always play a role. Uh, thanks a lot. It was very interesting. So, I have a very basic question. Um, so, in your world, if you have a money market fund and cash, uh, so in what way isn't it dominated by uh, you know having stable coin versus uh, deposits. And the way you model the uh, stable coin, you could think of the whole uh, global game thing, et cetera, could be more or less exactly the same thing with the money market fund. So there's this issue of the network externality that is a bit different. But if you have money market fund and cash, cash having the biggest network, uh, it seems like it's dominated. So why is there a stable coin in the end? What is it mm -hmm. exactly? Um, so, so that's a very good question, and that comes back to the kind of use cases uh, that are motivating in a way the heterogeneity. So, so clearly, if you have some sort of uh, uh, law for anonymity, if you have uh, use cases that are, you know, illicit use cases, then then clearly you uh, might have a demand uh, for this mean of payment, right? And you, uh, of course, you could also. Exactly, exactly. Of course, you can also do cash, uh, use cash, but uh, for cash, you can only do uh, in-person transactions. But if you want to do distant transactions, right, then of course, you would want to use uh, stable coins, perhaps, uh, as opposed to uh, bank transfers. Um, so uh, so that can be, uh, you know, uh, use cases I, I can think of that, that would clearly put you in this crypto enthusiast corner with, with a high gamma. But uh, yes, it really depends uh, also going forward on, on uh, the kind of new, news, new uh, use cases that are emerging maybe for low-cost remittance payments, but I don't know how the costs are comparing for individuals. Um, from, uh, from, uh, so I regularly visit uh, West Africa and I see, for instance, I'm regularly in Ghana. I can see there that people are getting more interested in stable coins. Why? Because the government is imposing an e-levy on all on the mobile phone transactions and all the bank transactions. Uh, and uh, the currency depreciates a lot, and there's a lot of uh, inflation. So I can see, you know, potentially some use cases in terms of currency substitution in future. But yeah, so 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 for me, uh, 
I would also love to move, know more about uh, uh, the actual use cases uh, of the investors. And together with colleagues, we are planning to do potentially an empirical project to learn a bit more about that because we can kind of track how different addresses are, are you know, uh, behaving in terms of the kind of trades they do. Uh, and we can distinguish between the kind of early adopters and the addresses that are, became active later and so on, and the addresses that are um, more likely to uh, engage into speculative activities like liquidators in, in, in the um, uh, uh, decentralized uh, environment. So yeah, but at the moment, I, I unfortunately don't know much about it. Well, if I could follow up on Ellen's point, uh, it's true that if I'm a citizen of a rogue state or if I want to buy illegal stuff on the dark net, I could use uh, stable coins. But I believe that it's not for, for the rest of us and for the majority of people, this is not an uh, uh, important preoccupation. And I believe that the, the, you hinted uh, in the beginning, in the introduction, the fact that the stable coins are on the blockchain and the yeah. blockchain allows you to do smart contracts. Yeah. So I believe it's more a question of implementing smart contracts more efficiently than what you yeah. can do, rather than payments that, that yeah. dominate. So yeah. I would like to see. Yeah. see it. It, yeah. what, what do you think about this? That's a good point. So, so, so probably I, I should have added that when I, when, when I was answering uh, your question. Uh, previously, so, so as I said at the beginning in the introduction, so uh, the stable coins play a key role in the crypto universe because uh, uh, they're not only used by crypto investors to park their funds. Uh, it's much better to, much more cost effective to park your funds there than to take out fiat, you know. Uh, and if you do uh, trades across currency exchanges yes. for technological reasons, it's going to be much lower transaction costs. Uh, if you compare it to, you know, one exchange, you sell your crypto assets, you get fiat. Uh, uh, do a bank transfer, get it to the other exchange, and you know. Yeah, I have a two handed on that. I mean, you just said that, you know, if you use any kind of blockchain transaction for payments, it's a disaster for transaction costs. So I can't see that, you know, by uh, using, for, as opposed to using the cash currencies, you are going to have lower transaction costs. Seems to me you are going to have massively high. Wait, so the, the on chain transaction costs are high, right? Because you have proof of working all these things. But most of the transactions here are off chain. Right, so it's the financial intermediaries, the currency, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, and so on that earn money. So then there's differences in transaction costs. It depends a lot on whether you do on-chain or off-chain transactions. But the vast number of transactions are off, uh, are off-chain, you know. So uh, just if I could uh, add a second remark, I don't believe that stable coins are a good vehicle for speculation because uh, they are. I mean, they are capped by the. They are supposed to be uh, uh, pegged to the US dollar. So to speculate on something that cannot grow, uh, it's not a very good idea, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's why that the kind of speculation I modeled was on the devaluation, right? So yeah, because the upside is that clearly, yeah. yeah. Rafael. At the beginning, you, you, you had a number of questions. And one of them, if I remember correctly, was about the effect of uh, monetary policy and competition for yeah. the financial system. I mean, I think that if, if, if monetary policy increases interest rates uh, and the uh, banks offering insured deposits are trans, uh, sort of paying positive interest on deposits, that's going to have an impact on uh, an asset and, 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 and that, that sort of it only pays you one for one, right? Yeah. So that's... Uh, that, that I, 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 that's a very good question. So, so, so that helps me to, to fill up some of the gaps I left. So in this presentation, I couldn't cover this extension. But yes, uh, uh, you're right. If uh, uh, the monetary policy rate is higher uh, and uh, banks are offering, offering a better rate, then of course, uh, the bank deposits are become, going to become relatively more attractive. So adoption in the model is going to be reduced of stable coins. Uh, moreover, if you think about stability, uh, there's the additional effect that uh, the stable coin has a higher uh, seniorage, basically. So, so it's easier for them to, to, to uh, in a way, uh, uh, meet redemptions and uh, to be stable. So it's uh, uh, promoting stability, basically. Uh, higher interest rates. Um, if uh, you're instead on a low, in a low rate environment, say low rates for longer, that uh, can make it also harder for the uh, issuer uh, to uh, to uh, keep the pack because you have a lower remuneration on your assets, right? But that's similar to to money market funds. So 
that's in a way nothing new. But only the adoption part in a way is, 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 is a bit new in that sense. Well, perhaps a more important issue uh, is, is the behavior of these sellers. I mean, this is, these are like shadows in your, yeah. in your model that yeah. are willing to accept uh, either stable coins or uh, deposits or both yeah. uh, with, uh, with these uh, probabilities. But, uh, but, but the, I mean, my concern is that they are selling at a fixed price, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. one. I mean, and, and, yeah. I mean, if I think of uh, the sort of closest analogy of what you are doing in terms of these random pairings, uh, I think of the Lagos right exactly. uh, model in which uh, you have these random pairings, uh, and you could have the alphas and the betas uh, there, but of course the, the sellers are the agents themselves. They are bargaining yeah. by the price, uh, right? So, I mean, that would be a way of, of sort of perhaps closing the model. That, that would be the, the morning market in the I see. right thing. I see where you're coming from. So so uh, I was also inspired by this Lagos right literature. But what is different uh, in their model is that uh, you have a certain probability to, to meet a seller, say, that, that wants to have payment in cash. If you don't have cash, there is no trade. In my model, it's different. You just have to pay a transaction cost to convert. So you can still have the trade. So that's in a way the difference between the two, or one difference between the two. But yeah, as, as you say there, one could think more about that and try to close the model there on this side. That's a very good comment, yeah. Christoph, a, a, a comment related to the, to the previous ones. It's still hard for me to see in practice, which is the key difference of stable coin via B existing things, in, existing intermediaries, bank, money market funds, et cetera, also in, 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 in your model. And we are in a central bank and we have to take care of financial stability, which are implications for regulation of that. Of course, if this is, uh, is uh, vehicle is used for illicit activities, we, we must forbid it. Uh, but if there is uh, like a bank or, or mutual fund, uh, we need to impose the same kind of regulation to to, to banks, etc. This is an open question in some sense. Could you elaborate a little bit based on your on, on your work? That's very important. So so I mean I for for that I guess I I have to take uh, to some degree a step uh, away from my work and then then maybe come back to it. So uh, um, from a regulatory viewpoint, I mean uh, I see this in the um, in in the shadow banking context. So these uh, issues are. Uh, very hard to regulate. They are uh, domiciled, uh, like for that tether on the Cayman Islands. Uh, you know, we 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 can't really verify their assets. Uh, um, they are uh, uh, operating all over the world, uh, and, and it's really hard to to regulate them, right? Uh, so there's a lot of regulatory leakage, and then the way you have to regulate them is you have to go after the intermediaries, basically. Um, and uh, uh, taking a step closer to my model. Uh, I think uh, actually from the viewpoint of my research, it's it's good that it's really hard to to regulate the stable coins well because that means that the kind of implications of my model remain relevant. Because of course, if you do a a very strict uh, proper narrow banking type of regulation, there is not going to be runs anymore. There is not going to be risk anymore. You might even give a, a central bank backstop. Uh, you might you know open some facility for stable regulated stable coin operators and so on, right? So uh, yeah, I think uh, that would be, of course, the obvious way to go to eliminate all the risks at low cost. I would say, uh, but uh, in practice, it's very hard. What would be the added value if you if you it would be completely similar to uh, to a bank deposit? So where, where would you add? Well, uh, here we come back to the technology and for the for the use in the crypto universe exactly. But when we see. This is a point I never understood. So uh, if you are into smart contracts like Jean-Charles, is it necessary to create a stable coin or could you do a smart contract if you have a CBDC, which is programmable? So what's the value added then even then of a private stable coin? That's a good question. So so, so uh, if you have a CBDC that has the set of technical functionalities, then of course uh, you could do all that. But you have to trust the central bank. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, yeah. Depending on the central bank. Yeah, yeah. Maybe again, there's a privacy issue, right? Or yeah, uh, things like that. Um, but. but
Good. Thank you very much, Christophe, for this uh, excellent presentation, this vivid topic. And I would like to invite our friend Inma to present about the bank slogan. Thanks a lot for the great questions. Okay, um, is it working? Good, thank you. Um, so I change a little bit the topic. Uh, it will be about uh, risk governance. And it works. So I want to say a little bit about, talk a little bit about what is risk governance. Um, it is it, it is essentially about, it's a part of corporate governance essentially. Corporate governance is about directing companies, um, the way they're directed, the way they are controlled. And um, risk governance is concerned about risk management, essentially. So it's corporate governance applied to risk management, if you want to. Now, this was, this was kind of the introductory slide. Um, and then I want to say a little bit about what is my plan for today. So there will be um, first a little bit about the literature, and I draw some motivation from there. Then I will say something about um, the design. How do I approach the question that is there? Um, the design is essentially a theoretical approach. It's an empirical paper, so it's a theoretical, technical problems that are in there. Then I come to data, um, the variables, uh, which will be very quick because I'm short in time. Um, I have slides, but I will run over them essentially. And the main point is risk taking and risk oversight. Um, that's where the main empirical results are. There are some things coming out, so I want to discuss them and then I conclude. So that's the plan for my presentation. Um, now, um, the starting point of this is how do I frame it, how to present, present it. Um, one way to look at it is that uh, there was the global financial crisis and certain deficiencies that came up, certain problems. Um, which were looked up upon in, in a couple of inquiries. These inquiries came up with certain problems, deficiencies. Um, one of them was the risk governance efficiency. So this is what the paper is kind of about. Essentially, the paper is about the solutions to it, if these solutions are adequate, if they really solve the problem or if they made things worse. So the answer is, to which I come to the end, probably they made things worse. <laughs> so let's see how this works. Um, so the, the background against so isolate three uh, changes, deficiencies that I want to look at. One of is, is uh, make boards more independent, increase the fraction of independent directors on the board, which is against the backdrop uh, that is very long in time. It started from the last, before the last, before the start of the millennium, at the end of the 90s, mid 90s, something there. It's a push to make, increase the willingness of the board to make decisions. We make them, keep them at arm's length from the CEO. So th that seems to make sense, I would, I would say. Um, so the request I make boards more independent, and I put it there, I have certain acronyms. One is IR, independence ratio. So increase the IR up means increase the independence ratio. We see it on certain points and same time. In the, in the presentation that we refer to this. The other thing is make increased financial expertise, make the board more expert or make, make them more knowledgeable about what they're talking about. The other one is uh, concentrate some decision-making expertise within risk management co competencies or essentially have risk management competencies, which is RC. So there's IR, FE, and RC. Um, so these are deficiencies. So th this was kind of the mo main motivation 
Now, what does the literature tell us? Um, the risk governance in the literature, I want to say, which I call RG, the later CG is corporate governance. What does the literature tell us? So that's a good starting point. There's a literature with three columns, I, R, F, E, R, C. Uh, the green means uh, it's positive. It confirms what what are the what problems were what we identified as problems. It says these are good solutions. So I the left column says essentially it makes sense. Okay, it decreases bank risk taking. But there are some in the last. On this left column, you see essentially maybe a caveat. Oh, what do you want to? I don't know what is the exact word right now, just to call it, which is essentially these positive aspects were confined to certain banks, which is to bail out banks, which are not maybe not the typical banks. I don't know which way this works essentially, but there may be a problem in there, maybe a problem of selecting the wrong banks to look at. Then with respect to financial expertise, it's unclear. With respect to risk, man risk management committees, it's unclear. And you see all of this literature is after the global financial crisis. Risk governance came essentially up with the global financial crisis. So it's not surprising that this literature is after that. But there's not too much literature in there. It is for something that affects every bank, that directs them what they have to do. That should be a solution to a big crisis. It's surprising that there's not much literature. So um, that's kind of the other side. So let's look at maybe we cannot learn anything from risk governance or from direct literature that looks at it. Maybe you can learn from something else, which is corporate governance, because risk governance is part of corporate governance, which I call one size approach. So you apply something from one part to another part. Um, the thing is that it seems to make sense, and that's the, the corporate governance literature. It should increase the willingness of the board to act, to, to control the CEO. That's the positive aspect. But then already very early, it has been noted, I cite here Jensen, that these directors have problems because they're outsiders. They're not inside the company. So they don't know maybe much about the company in general, and they have problems, to put it more, Theoretically, they have problems in acquiring, assessing critical information. So they can act, but maybe they don't know what to act. Maybe they act the wrong way because they don't know what they're doing. I, I exaggerate now a little bit, okay? But to make your point. So the, the problem with this, it seems to make sense, but the corporate governance looked on, the, on this and it tries to find a positive aspect, but it's very hard to find. So it's, maybe it's not there, maybe it's there, but, well, I don't want to take a step. So some problems with one size, with the approach of applying corporate governance to risk governance. Um, I, before I said something about there are more independent directors are more willing to act, but they face information problems. These information problems are very strong in banks. They're very opaque, difficult uh, to control companies. There are a lot of information problems. It requires very technical, precise knowledge. So maybe this shifts the trade-off. So we one size, even if it's good for corporate governance, where I say it's hard to find something with performance, maybe with banks, it is it's just different. Uh, maybe it's, it's better, maybe it's worse. I just don't know. Um, the other thing is that there's an argument, an immediate argument, applying corporate governance is equal to risk governance is maybe not a good idea. And I relate here to a finance theory argument, which is that an option theory argument, which is that essentially, if you increase the, the equity as an option, equity for the, for the stockholders, they have an option on the assets of the company. So a call option and call options increase in the risk, which means that if you want to increase expected value of the asset or put it in performance, then it's best to increase risk. Okay. So that means that if corporate, if you if increasing the fraction of independence is good for performance, then it should also be good for increasing risk. So that's the that's maybe maybe it's not the right way to increase it, even if it would work for corporate governance to increase the independence ratio. Maybe this is not it's the op it's not good for risk governance. It's the opposite. So the arguments are kind of not worked out very well. Like this. so, this is the, the starting point. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Um, 
So I already start with questions. Um, the main question is, do these governance reforms or adjustments to requests improve or, improve or do they worsen risk governance? The answer is um, the harm it. Um, and then there's an additional question, um, do they improve or worsen corporate governance? I'm not really interested about corporate governance, but there's something at the end where I touch upon it, so that phrase it as an additional question. The additional answer, increasing the fraction of independent directors worsens corporate governance. Now, this is kind of the summary slide because I don't know how much time I have. Um, so you have the questions, you have the answers, and the rest now, um, let's see how far we get, <laughs> okay? Um, I have far too many slides. Um, so I noticed this, but I had a hard time to, to cut it. So I, I learned it's best to give you a summary very early on than uh, if you don't want to follow, you cannot follow, I cannot present it, at least you got a little bit of a picture. So the research design is the next point. Um, over some of these slides, I will go very quickly. The usual approach to this is to do regressions. You regress risk measures on risk governance variables. Um, it works. Um, so we have the risk governance variables, independence ratio, financial expertise, uh, risk committees. You regress this. Oops. Uh, you regress it on risk measures. I come to it. What is risk measures? Now I'm just conceptually what I want to do. Um, and you see the, the, what what I would expect and what the literature expect would expect seems to expect is that the sign is negative. The beta on the risk governance variables should be negative. Increasing the independence ratio should decrease risk, which means a negative coefficient. So you can test it, and everything works hopefully. So this is kind of the yeah, but just, yeah negatively related to risk. Now, I want to look at another approach. Um, I, I will present this panel regression or panel regression approach, but I also present, want to present another approach. Um, so um, to, to figure out or present a little bit what I'm doing, I made a little bit of a picture, which is not perfect, um, but I hope from the way I approach it, you will figure out what I want to say. So there's a CEO and he decides, he decides on risk, or risk taking on a risk measure, which is a very, very shortcut. Uh, to what is happening. Then we have the board, and it monitors this this blue circle, how the CEO decides on risk. Now, at one point, the, the, the board has to do something, which is the action. And in this case, what I will look at is the mis dismissal of the CEO. That's the main question I would look at. Now, the main thing that the usual, or the usual approach in this literature is, what talks about usual, because the small literature is this green circle panel regressions. Panel regressions allow me to call it the first approach, the current approach is allow me to ask, uh, me to ask, uh, ask and answer the question how does risk governance affect risk? Okay. Now, uh, there we have the panel regressions, and I want to look at something else, which is kind of the, 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 the let me see the this area here, how the board interacts with the blue circle, which I put like this orange circle. It, 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 it's not working very well in terms of presentations. I'm not completely happy with this, but maybe you see that there's something else I, I, as, a, as a graphical figure, it, it's not well, I, I'm not happy, but I hope you get the picture there's something else. And then there's a second approach, how do risk governance, how does risk governance affect board actions? That's the second of a, approach. That's the main approach. That's the risk oversight approach that I want to look at, okay? So let's see. Um, the second approach is board characteristics or the risk governance characteristics, how would they affect CEO dismissal, okay? Um, it focuses on a key action, which is CO dismissal. One can discuss the other actions, these kind of things, but have to do certification. And it's one that has been done in literature, um, not in this risk governance in literature, but in the corporate finance literature. Um, there is this, what I cite here, that's in Murphy, for example, in 1990, but from the other papers, which usually will look at it not in the way I look at it. I look at it through survival regressions, they usually do categorical regressions where they look at 
a dismissal and the year before, and what are the characteristics in the year before leading to dismissal, okay? Now, survival regressions do it a little bit differently. They have something which they call a hazard and a score function, which is built mathematically in there. And the hazard is something like, it's the hazard of being dismissed. So it's, it's like a risk that accumulates. And at one point, the CEO is kicked out. If, if he has done too much bad things at one point, the likelihood is too much and then he's kicked out. But it's not that it's the immediate action that kicks him out. It's something that accumulates. Sometimes I make the analogy, if you say that if smoking kills, then you don't think that the last cigarette kills the guy or the woman, but it's the accumulated effect of smoking that kills. Okay, so it's something in here. That's what happened. Now, one has to see a little bit um, the, one has to think a little bit about the sensitivities. So a positive sensitivity means that increases the hazard or the risk of being dismissed. So it is like maybe something like this incentivizing later on. It, I, I don't want to talk about incentives because it leads in the wrong direction, but it's something that is bad for the CEO because it increases his, his risk of being dismissed. But it's critical to, to think a little bit about the science of the variables, the sensitivities, okay? So I want to focus on, in this case, on risk oversight, which is how risk governance affects dismissal or essentially risk-based dismissal. So we have here this score function. I cannot get too much into details. Um, so the score function has here the certain variables, risk measures, I have risk governance variables, and I need critically this interaction term. This is what I want to look at. This is what I want to study. Because the interaction term is really giving me what I want to know. Because looking at risk measures or risk governance variables will not really answer me the question that I want to know. I want to know if increasing this risk governance variables makes the, dis makes the dismissal more sensitive, more reactive to risk, which is so it says it is essentially this risk interaction term here that matters. Okay, it's not risk. I'm not interested in risk leading to dismissal. I'm interested is how our risk governance variables change this sensitivity, and that gives me the interaction term. So the main hypothesis in here is that this sensitivity is positive. Because it's positive, it makes the board, makes you see the board, or including these board variables, makes the risk more sensitive to be dismissed if he increases risk. That means more risk is worse, which means that it should give me hopefully something like less risk if I talk about incentives, which I don't want to talk about, but it should be what I want to have in this risk element. Okay, now, probably I'm, two major issues. Um, I need to control for performance, okay? Um, I don't want to talk much about performance because I want to talk about risk governance, but it, 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 it would be simply wrong to think the CEO is being dismissed because he, there's a lot of risk. Risk is his business, so I need to control if risk leads to performance, how it interacts, I need to control for it. This is the first issue in there. So all these regressions include performance variables, okay? The other one, the second point is I call it, it's a little bit of a shortcut drawing statistical or inferences. One is that I will use as a natural experiment the introduction on the independence ratio in 2002. Um, and the other one is there are many facets in risk. So I look at a lot of risk measures. Now let's see. Um, that was the, the, the hard part, kind of. Now comes the easy part, the, the data. Um, so there's accounting data, which is from the Federal Reserve. Um, the, the governance data is from Bordex. Um, the, from there, I take for every company or every bank, in this case, uh, the number of directors, the number of independent directors, I can get the fraction, the independent ratio, I can figure out if they have financial expertise because backgrounds is in this database of the, of the persons on the board. 
and they can construct a zero one variable if there's a risk management committee. There's market data, there's compensation data, which I don't use much. Uh, at one point you will see it. And there's a final data sample with 400, almost 500 banks um, over a period of 20 years. Um, yeah. um, I will run over this one um, because I'm, I don't have enough time. But for completeness, it's there. Um, or for completeness, honestly, <laughs> then doing actually with something with it. There, there, I look at a variety of risk measures and I structure them in three categories. One is what I call regulatory risk measures. So there's the leverage ratio, the T1 capital ratio. Then the second category is economic risk measures. Uh, the risk density, um, asset volatility, Z-score, probability of default, which is rated to Z-score, uh, or volatility, stock volatility, and tail risk measures. Uh, derivatives usage, off-balance sheet activities, uh, tail risk, um, the catalysis. Okay. Um, what you see on the right is, right now it's not too important, there's a certain sign, because I want to figure out that all variables mean increases, in the variable mean increases in risk. So to simplify the interpretation, some of these variables, you will see them negatively, okay? So for example, the T1 ratio, more higher capital is good, but I want it to be that increases in the variables mean higher risk, so I look at minus T1 always, okay? Yes? Why, why? Could be, could be, could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's what I that's what I interpret. I use it. I'm right. I can use it as hedging. I can use it as um, as a um, whatever as, as as something that is bad. Terrorist. Okay. I would say essentially that. What I don't know what is on the other side of the position. Okay. So I don't know why why they hold. I cannot figure it out. So. You're right, there's a caveat in this interpretation. But maybe if you want to look at it from this perspective, maybe it's good to complement it with other risk measures to corroborate what is what is going on in there. So I cannot answer your question. That I think I gave it. You got it. But I'm maybe what I refer to derivatives are weapons of mass destruction, which said Warren Buffett. So maybe that's the interpretation that I have in mind. Um, but your point is that, okay? Um, now, um, same thing, I will run over these and I come through the empirical results. Um, so the first I want to look at the panel regressions um, and I will only present um, one economic risk measure, one regulatory risk measure and one tail risk measure because I'm interested in what you will see that there are differences between the categories of risk measures that are in there. So, so this is why I'm not too much concerned about your point that maybe hedging, maybe something else. Okay. So um, the results. Ah, before getting to results, I'm getting to. Okay. Uh, so these are panel regressions. They have the independence ratio. So the dependent variable. These are the independence ratio, financial expertise, risk committees. Is it the expenditure variables? I control for incentives, risk-taking incentives, uh, which is VEGA. The paper also does it without. Uh, there, there are lots of control tables, um, other tables where the variables change. Look at it from different perspectives. And uh, the other variable to control is total assets. Okay, So this is the, the structure of the, of the table. Um, the first thing is I want to look at the regulatory risk measures, you see all the coefficients are negative, which means that um, they all decrease risk, which is good. I put a smiley in there, smiling face. Um, the next one is that economic and tail risk measures, I, I should change the order, okay? So that's paper presentation, which is to do, uh, so it flows a little bit better. Um, the red box, they are all positive, except uh, the risk man, risk committee variable, okay? Um, so I have the opposite. Um, so what should I do? This part of the discussion at the end, okay? Or when I come there. 
Um, so the next thing is that um, the causality, um, I want to use the changes in 2002 as a natural experiment. And what I continue to see is, unfortunately here, this is not very strong, but, and this is also not very strong, but here I have a positive impact. So this means I have a positive sensitivity, which means that economic risk measures tell me that increasing the independence ratio increases risk taking, okay? Um, and the other thing is that one has a certain split in between regulatory and economic risk measures, which is kind of the result that I get here. And the other one I said, it, it's detrimental definitely according to economic risk measures. Um, now, let's look at the risk oversight, the survival regressions. Um, now the table is, is a little bit longer because I said I need to control for performance. Um, I don't present performance here. The table is too big, okay? Um, and because I have two, I have more variables and I have interactions also, there are also more variables. So it becomes more difficult to find something, confirm something empirically, okay? Nevertheless, it works. And uh, other than that, uh, I think, same thing here, we have the economic risk measures. We have here on the other side, on the right-hand side, there we have the regulatory risk measures. What I do is, I think I cannot look at CO dismissal, just risk, or just tail risk, because tail risk is an add-on in there. It means that if I look at tail risk, I must control for risk, and I must control for performance. I am, with tail risk, I have more variables in this regression, and I have, and you see here, regression one, regression two actually is, is exactly the same as regression one, just that it has the paid risk variables and the, the interaction term and the original variable in there. Okay, the same with four, the same as three, just that it has the paid risk. Okay, um, tail risk is here, some tail risk variable, in this case, our A protosis, okay, um, and all the derivatives uses. Um, I'm mostly interested in these interaction term. I think I said this before. And I want to look at a positive variable. I'm expecting if things work as I expected, as the hypothesis is, as the regulatory desires, I want a positive sensitivity. Because positive sensitivity, IR with risk means that if it's positive, it means when I increase the independence ratio, then the, the CO dismissal becomes more reactive to risk. Risk, it becomes when risk increases, the likelihood to be dismissed is higher, which is what I would want to see as a regulator. Okay? So this is like the same as decreased risk taking means here, negative sign before means here, I want a positive sign. Okay, so this is what I put here as a note. Now the results. Um, Okay, I look at this box. Um, the sensitivity increases with respect to regulatory risk measures. Okay, um, I mean you can you can you can discuss it's it's only slightly uh, significant, but it is significant. There are more tables, more more analysis, confirmations in, in this. I mean, of these tables don't work as well as I wanted, but I want to have a clear picture that goes through. But it's positive, it's significant, so it means that, though I don't want to use it incentives because it gets in the wrong direction, but it gives you a better picture of what it goes to. The positive sign means risk. Uh, the positive sign is what I wanted to get. Now, the next thing is then, uh, with economic risk measures, uh, I have negative signs, which is the opposite, okay? Um, and with respect to tail risk measures, um, I cannot document anything, okay? Now, if you, if you look at it a little bit, I don't know if you noticed it, I am only talking about the independence ratio, because with financial expertise and risk committees, when I add them, I have, I have too many variables. It, it, the, the analysis doesn't work, okay? And the other thing is that financial expertise is, is a fairly persistent variable. Risk committees is also persistent variables. 
this committee is a zero one variable. It's, it, it, it's very hard to figure out anything in there. Um, but on the other hand, the, um, the panel regression analysis gives a picture about financial expertise, risk committees, and it all works in the same direction. So I don't find this bad. Now the causality is, um, it again confirms what we good, good, I hope I will make it uh, what, what I wanted. I'm at my discussion, um, so hopefully that works. Um, now, the thing was, which we noted as a summary, there was a regulatory, there were regulatory risk measures, regulatory risk measures. I find what I expect. Increasing the independence ratio uh, decreases risk taking, it makes dismissal more sensitive to risk. It disincentivizes risk, whereas with reg economic risk measures and tail risk measures, I find the opposite. Okay. I call this the split between regulatory and economic tail risk measures. So what shall I do? That, that was my problem for a long time um, until I um, came up with or figured out about or remembered whatever it was about good house law, as I call it, as soon as the government attempts to regulate any particular set of financial assets, these become unreliable indicators of economic trends. I, I think of it like the Heisenberg principle in physics, if there's an object and I try to measure, what is it, speed and position, I cannot do both at the same time. So one always is off. If I try to regulate it, I cannot measure it anymore. It, it becomes unreliable because the, the economic agents change their behavior. That's my interpretation. Um, I don't want to get much into it. They change their behavior, try to do what the regulator wants. And so that, then it's exactly, I get what he wants, obviously. I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay? It, it means, in my interpretation, I cannot access, assess the risk governance by regulatory risk measures, okay? Um, on the other hand, there is something one can learn from there, and that's essentially that they, they try to do what the regulator, do. I mean, I, it's not giving me the answer what I'm looking for, but on the other hand, they try to do what the regulator wants, okay? So they are kind of complying on paper, okay? And the other one is, I call it, it's like regulatory arbitrage, which is regulatory capital arbitrage, but there's something here like regulatory risk arbitrage. It's related to it. So it resounds something in there. Banks are complying with regulators, but they're tweaking the rules. <laughs> kind of in there. That's, it's not that one can document it that easily. There's a paper that I have in mind, but the documents this, but it's, it seems to be everybody talks about this, okay? Now, what are the implications regarding our main question? Um, it is essentially that I, I don't trust, if you want to put it, or I cannot trust the regulatory risk measures and the economic and tail risk measures all point in the same direction, namely that these risk governance requests are detrimental, they're bad, okay? Um, now, the, the question then comes up, um, it, it, it seems that the independents in particular seem to want to increase risk. That's what I see. More independence means more risk. It means less sensitive to dismissal is less sensitive to risk. Do they really want to take risk? It, it, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe my hypothesis is wrong. Um, my starting point is wrong. Maybe they want to take risk. Maybe they should take risk. Increase risk. Maybe that's the right way to do. Okay. Um, if so, then increasing the independence should improve performance. If they do this on purpose, maybe they do this on purpose. They do the right thing. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everything is okay. Well, there's no problem. Maybe that's it. That's the hypothesis on the next slide. So maybe then, but then they should improve performance. There should be something good coming out of there if they do it on purpose. Okay. Now uh, I think I don't know where I was, but I'm, I'm close to finishing. Okay. okay? Sorry. <laughs> um, now I want to look at residual performance, performance and performance residual. Okay. One is that um, now here you see all the measures because it was that. Um, I thought presenting you only one economic on one regular risk module, it was just that 
the one I did are able to, it did not, nothing came out. So I need to present you the full table to really say something. The table can say something and say, refer, refer you to the appendix and it comes out, but here the, the negative result would not convince you of anything. Okay. And so here it is that one thing is that if I regress, but there's panel A and panel B. Panel A regressed this performance on risk, the respective risk measure, which is here in the column heading, and on average excess performance, which is performance, systematic performance. Okay. So risk here is maybe maybe it's a different concept of risk, which is like excess performance or that. In any case, what you see is that risk is always has a negative coefficient, which means that more risk is bad for performance. Now, the answer to the question before is if they do this on purpose, if they increase risk and they do it on, perform on purpose, then at least for performance, it's not good. Okay, which seems much questions it kind of. Um, that they do it deliberately, that they do it on poor performance, it, the, why would they do it? it? It destroying performance, okay? The other thing is then, I'm more interested in residual performance to some extent, because performance, performance is related to risk. More risk means higher risk premium, higher leverage. Uh, you decide on leverage, but everything is okay. If I get from an asset management tax perspective um, that I take, more risk is not necessarily bad. More risk means higher risk premium means more better compensation. Everything is okay for me. If you want to take more risk, take more risk. If you want to take less risk, you take less risk. Everything is fine. The thing that I care about is residual performance. In the asset management literature, that's Jensen's alpha. I want them to create outperformance. I want to create positive outperformance. I want to create them positive Jensen's alpha in the asset management literature or positive residual performance, okay? So I decompose from the first here from panel A, there's something left over, which is residual performance, okay? And that I regress on the independence ratio. So it, what is not coming out perfectly well, this, this sign here is positive, okay? Um, why, I don't know. Um, Exactly, but all the other ones are negative, which means that not only are they are increasing risk, by taking more risk, they are bad for performance, but they're also bad for residual performance, which is like selecting the right assets, selecting the right, right way to provide credit, these kind of things. So it's bad from a variety of perspectives for performance. Um, uh, no, I forgot to click. Um, so the last one is survival regressions, then I'm done. Um, which is the same table they had before, but uh, here I don't present the risk variables. Now I look at the performance variables, okay? Now, the, the, the interaction term independence ratio with residual performance is positive, which means that more residual, when I have a higher independence ratio, then the more I increase residual performance, the more likely is that the CEO gets kicked out, which, which doesn't make any sense. I mean, not, I mean the empirics are very clear, um, but it makes, makes sense from another perspective. And that is that, okay, the interpretation is they all do the right thing, they want to do the right thing, um, they're willing to act in the right way and make them independent of the CDOs so they're able to do it, but they don't look like they want to increase risk deliberately, but maybe they are, if you remember the starting point, I said there's like, like a trade-off. It makes them more able to act, they're more independent from the CEO, but maybe they have informational problems in there, informational deficiencies in there. Maybe they are less capable to carry out their duties. So maybe it, it is just they're overloaded, overwhelmed. They cannot fulfill what they want to do. And I have them independent from the CEO, but it, I made things worse because now they cannot carry out the, these outsiders which are sitting there on the board cannot carry out their duties anymore. So I call this negligent. They are more negligent. They became the board became more negligent and became detrimental in the end. So now the conclusion, and then I'm done. Um, 
a variety of risk measures. Um, I have the split between economic and tail versus regulatory risk measures. One works as I expected, the other one doesn't work. Um, it, to me, it makes sense what Goodhart or Goodhart's law says, namely that these regulatory measures, I cannot trust them, which means in my interpretation that uh, these risk governments requests are detrimental or bad in the end. It's not deliberate action. Um, that doesn't make any sense. And it seems to be negligence. And in the end, the things got worse. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions or comments from the audience. Um, a few comments, minor comments. One is that uh, for big compensation of the CEOs and, and the top management also, I don't know if you include it into, into your control variables. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you, do you find that it has a, an implica uh, implication of risk taking? Uh, I have it as Viga, which is, let me see. There, there you have it. Uh, it is essentially, with regulatory risk measures, it has a positive impact, and with the other ones, in this table, I cannot find, uh, on, the, on the economic, I cannot find an impact. Viga is, um, I mean, the derivative to volatility, mm -hmm. okay? um, of the, which is calculated according to some standards in, in the literature. I, I, I have to look up the exact references, how, how this calculated. Okay. This is the Vega of what, the stock? This is the Vega of the CEO compensation. the CEO compensation, okay. Yes, that's it. It's not the Vega of the, of the stock, of the option. Uh, no. The second comment is about the cyclical aspect of the decisions of the board. It seems to me that there is a lot of uh, imitation or tournament aspect of this. If everybody's making money uh, and uh, if you decide to uh, be more cautious by taking less risk, probably you will be fired. Mm -hmm. Because the other banks are making money, and you know, the new. So I guess you could uh, yes. take that into account. That's, finally, like a, that's like a reputation, uh, or just a uh, time, by, a time. Uh, yes, that means you know, cyclical. It is. A, there is a very good one. What looked at? I, I I haven't looked at it here in in this last. But there is some a variable, which is like the number of boards I'm sitting on, which is like busyness. But it's not exactly. But it's also like. Um, I looked at compensation on this board relative to the other boards, which is giving like an indication how important is sitting is for me sitting on this board relative to the all the other boards that I'm sitting on, and that may make me that, that may answer a little bit your question. And I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, but I want to say there is a time dimension. Yeah. And finally, I'm not I'm not convinced that you can apply a good art flow, uh, which was designed for monetary policy uh, things. Uh, for regulation, because I believe that uh, uh, capital ratios, for example, they are used by financial analysts to, to, to signal to the market. And I believe that the bankers pay attention to their capital ratios. Maybe they are not a good measure of risk. That's one thing, but they have an impact. I believe they have an impact. Yes, yes, they have an impact. People are watching it, no, not, it's, not it's, just the regulator. It's the opposite of good outflow, because good outflow says uh, well, as soon as you use it as a regulatory variable, it disappears. So uh, I, I think it, it matters. Maybe I should change the interpretation in there. Maybe I should change the story. What I take out of it is that I cannot rely on it. That's my interpretation. I, I, I'm, I cannot rely on it to make inferences. And you yeah. say people take make inferences in the market so maybe it is taken in the way, but maybe I can apply it here in a more specific way. In the broader market, you apply it, but in the smaller regulatory or whatever purpose market in here, maybe I cannot trust on it. Mm -hmm. But I see your point. I see your point in there. Mm -hmm. focusing on CRO centralities, uh, chief risk officer. Uh, mainly the data is uh, during and before the global financial crisis showing that uh, those institutions in which risk management mattered, so basically at the table was not only the CEO pulling all the, all the shots, those uh, uh, surfaced the crisis much better. But I think it's, if you control for such uh, CRO centrality, 
might provide an answer and provide some heterogeneity in the results why for some institutions it matters the indicators, not for others. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, the CROs came up, at least in this data I have, it came up much later. And it's a very, I don't know, I'm, it came around up around this time, I think, mostly, the, the, the global financial crisis. So it doesn't help me to answer this question that I had. And the other thing was that the, the problem with the CRO is that it, it's, it's a zero one variable again. And zero one variables are very persistent. And I, in the survival analysis, I have a lot of, I, I wouldn't have a lot of variables. So I have a hard time to do it. I, I, the data doesn't, I, I try to, maybe I'm wrong. wrong. Ah, yes, yes. I think I looked at that also. There's like the fraction of the percentage of the CO salary in relation to the CO that I looked at. The problem is that the, the compensation data is, I have compensation data only for a much smaller uh, sample of, of this one. So, um, um I have problems I have problems on, on different on different aspects in there. That's but maybe we can talk and maybe there's a way to do it. I don't know. But um I will take a look again. Maybe I, something comes out to address it in some way. Control for it, right? That's what you say. Okay. So um thank you. So I have also a basic question. So uh, what's the sample? And uh, so in the sample, there are lots of uh, regulatory breaks. So I assume you control for them with then some kind of time fixed effects, or I don't know, but then we are seeing everything in relative terms. How am I supposed to interpret the magnitude of your of your findings? Or I mean, I, I, have, I have problems to A, to think about how you can extract the effect given all the regulatory breaks the timing of implementations, et cetera. And second, so should I think of it in relative terms, but then how do I, how significant is it? I mean. What, what do you mean by relative or, or I don't know? So over time, you know, your risk, it could be that your, your risk uh, has significantly declined and then you are just identifying that in the cross section, there's a number of things that go against that. I mean, how big are those effects? Okay. I mean. So, you mean economically the size of it, or you know, whatever one of your measures? I mean, what whatever measure. and, and and all these regulatory changes. How are you? Uh, maybe with independence ratio to give you an answer a little bit. Um, but then you ask again. The, uh, the the typical independence, the average independence ratio in this data sample is around eighty percent. The minimum is fifty percent, the regulatory minimum. So we are thirty percentage points above the fifty percent, which means we are well beyond it for whatever for whatever reason uh, that is in there. Um, so that means that. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, it, if you, let's stay with this one, the second column. We have four. And you multiply it with 0 0.3. So you have one, and it's percentage. The, the T1 is percentage, so it increases uh, the, 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 the T1 capital ratio by 0 0.3 times the four that we have, which is 1.2. It's percentages, so it increases it by 1.2 percentage points, okay, relative to whatever the the eight percent or the six percent or the four percent, whatever. Say so take the eight percent that we see, ten percent error. So maybe there's it, it's sizable. That that's economic impact, but that was not. That was just one aspect of your question. Yes. 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 Yeah, this is why I control for um, for time fixed effects. I control for uh, and another point. In a lot there's a lot of a big appendix. There's also a dummy variable that where I control for, uh, for before and after the GFC, 
that are the changes in the, the, the different kinds of analysis. So I try to make take into account this time effect, that the regulatory changes specifically after the, the crisis in the India, okay? And it's in, in all the regressions, they, they are in there, okay? Yes. Ah, to some extent, that's easy, that's only the US. So that makes it easier, but uh, insofar as um, some are implemented differently, I, I have the changes in the T1, which were implemented over time. You, you're right. Um, hopefully, hopefully, I, could, I mean, hopefully the time fixed effects pick that, pick that up. Okay. But um, I don't know if there's a way to, I right now don't know if there's a way to, to control or test for this. If, I could split it in subsamples, maybe, but uh, I, I would think about it. Okay. It's a very persistent. It's a very persistent. Uh, the, yes. Maybe that's a way to. Maybe it's interesting. I, I will take a look. Okay. I I, I cannot. I, I don't have it. I, I did a lot of analysis, but I don't have everything on my. <laughs> I forget these things. Um, I have three short comments. Uh, now, I would expect the uh, independence ratio to have nonlinear effects on the outcome variables. So uh, maybe you should introduce, maybe you have already some, the, the square of the IR just to sort of uh, take care of. I, I, yes, happened there. The, the thing that I expect is kind of. So we have the minimum at 50%. We, now we are at, at 80%, as I said. So maybe there's it goes up, and then the, the nonlinear means that it goes up, and now we have some probably at some optimum in there. I, I the problem that I have, I, I don't want to take it as an excuse, but I have data problems. If I had the I have the I have cross terms, I need to add not only the independence ratio, but also squared cross terms in the independence ratio. And, yeah. I mean, um, my suggestion is that you just try um, and so, <laughs> the basic regression, see what happens. Now, given these contracts. I, I also did it, sorry, to, I also did it, I don't remember. The panel analysis, I could do it. I did it, I don't, right now, I, I don't have it in my mind what comes out, so I cannot properly answer your question. But I looked at it, and the other thing was that I thought it was not, for, for me, it was not, it was like answering why are we at, at an optimum? It, I was getting into the discussion personally. I felt like, why are we, why are we not at 50%? That was one point what, that I was interested. Why are we well beyond the 50%? Why were we, why were we at 80%? Why is everything is 80, roughly 80% the independence ratio? So I wanted to understand why they are not increasing it further anymore or why they are not lower. So there must, looks to me like, like an optimal, maximal yeah, that is in there. So this is why I was interested in this question. Not, not necessarily you refer to it as a as a nonlinearity per se that is in there. Or I mean, yeah, because I, I mean, I, I, I mean, if it's linear, then you should go all the way to hundred yes. percent in one case. So I think yes. that that's kind of odd. And yeah, the model you will find. Uh, yeah, but remember that this is this is about positive economics, not normative. I mean, there is no. Yeah, they shouldn't. You, you shouldn't attach any sort of judgment whether this is good or bad. This is basically what uh, the yeah. data shows now. Uh, second uh, comment is that it would be nice, probably you have it, uh, to have a correlation table between the regulatory and the economic uh, risk measures just, to see, That's good. just to see yeah. what is happening there yeah. in terms of the different yeah. uh, ways to, uh, well, yeah. maybe they are measuring different things yeah. and perhaps that would be useful. Yes. And the final thing is that if, if, if in terms of the controls, uh, something that perhaps would be worth adding is uh, a variable relates to charter values, which are an important determinant in the banking theory uh, the literature to and, and something like market to book, uh, as long as you have banks which are traded, maybe a, 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 a useful control to, to sort of clean some of the effects that may be happening otherwise. You mean like a risk? Um... 
Mm-hmm. Let's put it like this. Banks that have a lot of charter I mean, value are more cautious, that, maybe. Or... Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a market to book, to book is high, that means that uh, everybody's yeah. going to be more prudent, and therefore yes. uh, you can you can see the effect of independence in terms of yes. uh, once you control yes. for that. I will take a look. Okay. Thank you very Um, like a tisane. It smells like a tisane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's bitter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this was good.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. So I'm Jean-Charles Rocher, and uh, uh, on behalf of the Scientific Committee of Ridge, I'm very proud and very excited to introduce Hélène Ray, who is a, a star of our profession. So we are very grateful to her that she accepted to, to come to Montevideo. So uh, Hélène uh, has so many awards and so many uh, uh, recognition, but I, I will not cite all of them, but uh, let me just say a few. Uh, she got the inaugural uh, Birgit Grodel Award from the European Economic Association. She got the Bernasser Prize in, in uh, 2006. She got the Irio Janssen Award from the best young uh, uh, European economist together with uh, Thomas Piketty. And, uh, and, so, uh, and there are many others. Uh, she is an elected fellow of the British Academy uh, of the Economic Society, the European Economic Association, et cetera, et cetera. So Hélène is, uh, got her PhD from the London School of Economics and uh, HSS in France. And then she got a, a position in Princeton. She is now the Lord Bagri Professor of Economics at uh, London Business School. And her research focuses on the determinants and consequences of external trade and financial imbalances, the theory of an empirics of financial crisis, and uh, the organization of the international monetary system. So Hélène, Thank you for coming and congratulations. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Charles. So that was, of course, excessively nice. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, the hospitality is fantastic. I just uh, tested Mate for the first time. So I'm, <laughs> I'm all fired up. So, uh, you know, I'm all ready to, uh, to dive into this. Uh, uh, this topic, which is uh, actually connects a bit to the very great presentation we just had, but at uh, macro level kind of thing, uh, which is about uh, financial crisis. So is this time different? Financial follies across centuries, and this is joint work with uh, Jeremy Fulia and Vanya uh, Stavrakeva. So uh, we all know that uh, financial crises uh, are a big deal. They uh, cause a lot of trouble, both economic, social, political, and uh, this is not a new thing. So economic historians have been extremely uh, uh, you know, concerned with financial crisis, have written a lot about it. And here I just put uh, a quote of Keynes, just to remind us that this is something which is really with us for a long time. And Keynes point out uh, that really, uh, it was, of course, in the 1930s, just after the Great Depression, we have blundered in the control of a delicate machine, the working of which we do not understand. The result is that our possibilities of wealth may, may run to waste for a time, perhaps for a long time. So these are extremely costly events. Uh, we also know from the database of Luc Leven and uh, Valencia uh, at the IMF that indeed the cumulative output loss from banking crisis are, are, very, are very large. Now, if you fast forward um, in 2008, uh, so uh, this is just after Lehman Brothers, okay? And uh, I understand some of you were kind of doing their PhDs at the same at that time <laughs> in Toulouse. Um, there is uh, the, the queen visiting the, uh, the LSE, and uh, she's shown by Luis Garicano here, that's from his Twitter uh, feed. But there were all these imbalances in the banking sector and all of these, these leverage data and so on and so on. And so it's all very terrible. And she turns around and then she asks, OK, so why did nobody notice it? Right? And uh, that was a very good question. Uh, and on, on the spot, she didn't get a huge answer from the, the economic faculty. And so much so that after several months, we have the, uh, the economic section of the British Academy who felt that they had to write a letter to the Queen explaining better why it is that people had not noticed uh, the crisis and uh, building up, the risk building up. And there is a, a, a three-page letter, you can find it on the, on the web. Um, but so here I just quote part of it, which says that it was principally a failure of a collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. So again, it's a bit like the Keynes thing. We don't have a complex system. We just don't understand. We don't connect the dots. We don't understand how it works. That was the same type of answer. 
Now, Luis, having seen that I was using this auto, uh, Twitter auto told me, you know, I did answer something to the queen at the time. And I told her at every stage, someone was relying on somebody else and everyone thought they were doing the right thing. Okay, so that was the, uh, the answer he gave at the time. So we are going to, uh, here in this paper, to kind of revisit this question uh, from more from an academic uh, point of view, but also from an empirical, uh, actually from an empirical point of view, and try to, uh, uh, to give a more systematic answer. And what we are going to try to do, which is quite, uh, in a way, bold, is uh, to try to predict the systemic uh, banking crisis well in advance, three years ahead, using some kind of... Um, machine learning tools, which are not going to be, I can reassure you, a kind of black box, uh, weird uh, model, but it's going to be uh, an optimal mo model aggregation technique. So it's a very different type of uh, tool than, uh, than what you might think in terms of machine learning. And the reason we, uh, we go for three years ahead, it's because we do need, uh, when we, are, we have macroprudential authorities, which we do have now, with Basel III in, in a lot of countries, not everywhere. We do need a lead time to implement policy. So first of all, um, one of the main tools of macroprudential policies are the counter-cyclical buffers. And most counter-cyclical capital buffers can be uh, up and down depending on the decision of a macroprudential authority. Once you actually decide what to do, uh, there's a 12 month lag before the banks have to implement it. So that's already one year right there. And it does take a bit of time for the authorities to, to move. So this is why we, we are going to try to predict pre-crisis instead of crisis, so three years before, so that we have time for, for policy. The title of the paper is, of course, inspired by the Reinhardt and the Rogoff book. Uh, and uh, I'm quoting here from that book. No matter how different the latest financial frenzy or crisis always appears, there are usually remarkable similarities with past experience from other countries and from, and from history. So in some sense, they are saying, you know, there is some information that economic historians or other countries, you know, have gone through similar things. We are failing to connect the dots. It's not going to be true for all possible crises. I mean, we discuss that later, but, but there's a big, sufficiently high number of these banking, systemic banking crises, but it essentially have something in common, there's some commonalities. So it's up to us to find what it is and to use it uh, to forecast them better. That's a bit the idea. We are going to test uh, this claim uh, in this paper. And we're going to test it using, in terms of data, the macro history data set of Jordan, Shularik, and Taylor, which is uh, a data set containing standard macroeconomic uh, variable since uh, 1870. Okay, so it's, uh, it's going to have all the main macro variables you can think about, plus some uh, credit variables, plus some uh, um, asset valuations. But that's it, essentially. It's not, it's not super fancy. Uh, and what we are going to try to do sounds a bit crazy at first sight. We are going to, uh, we were very intrigued whether we could predict the Great Depression out of sample. That was really something that intrigued us a lot. So that's what we are going to try to do. So we are going to learn uh, on uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And then we are going to go out of sample from essentially the 1910s to predict, to see if we can predict the Great Depression. And then the big challenge is there is this, you know, Great Depression in many countries, slightly different times. Then we have, of course, the, the interwar periods, and then we have Bretton Woods, and we have not many banking crises at all during the Bretton Woods. So everything is period, so everything is quiet. Until the 1980s and 90s, where some countries experience some idiosyncratic banking crisis and not others. And then we had 2008. So that's a, a bit of a tall order to try to, to do forecast out of sample during that entire period. But that's what we are trying to, we're going to try to do. Okay, we don't start from uh, zero. We're not starting from zero. There is a, a sizable and uh, famous with, uh, literature with a lot of famous papers on early warning indicators of financial crisis starting maybe with uh, the work of Kaminsky and Reinhardt, but a lot of people have contributed. 
Um, there is a very nice survey for those of you who are interested by Sufi and Taylor in the latest handbook of international economics, in which they really look at all this literature in great detail. There has been a revival, especially with economic history data and uh, the work of Alan Taylor and his and Moritz Schurarik and his co-authors there. Uh, a lot of this literature uses relatively simple um, econometrics, so very simple models, typically logits. Uh, and uh, a lot of that early literature, uh, and, and even the recent literature, focuses really on a very limited set of variables. So right now, as we know, around the BIS, we have credit growth to GDP, GAP, uh, which is one of the main variables. Sometimes we interact with valuations, uh, some uh, debt sustainability ratios, some housing market variable, but it, it not, you know, a lot of it is a very limited number of variables. Uh, there is a literature which is recent using machine learning models, but in a very different uh, sense that's what I'm going to do. So these are using, you know, I don't know, random forest and see whether you, you do better with a random forest than you do with logits, something like that. In theory, we do have a lot of theories. Um, and that's the, uh, um, you know, that, that's the beauty in a way of... Uh, of the field, usually in, in, in macro, it's, it's not like that. You can look at things in many different ways, and it's uh, a lot of people have a point, right? And uh, the, the thing is, probably some ingredients of a lot of these models have something to say about about reality. That's why it's good to try to encompass a lot of uh, different possible theories and uh, and to see when they apply, when they don't apply, and maybe different across countries and across time. So just here, I cite a few, but I could have gone for like many more pages of theories. In crisis, very often we have different variables, nonlinear interactions, and time varying effects. So that makes things quite complicated. This is why uh, this methodology on online learning, uh, which is about model aggregation, is I think quite suited to, to try from an empirical point of view, to, uh, to improve our forecast of uh, financial crisis. Why? Because by definition, it's going to be about aggregating different models. So we'll be able to take different viewpoints on what may cause crisis. Uh, it's a very general methodology because we are not going to make any assumption on the data generating process. It doesn't need to be, uh, you know, to be uh, stationary or anything like that. There will be time varying weights in the process of aggregation. So that's good when you think the structure of the economy may change. Uh, it's, it's a methodology that has been designed to prevent overfitting. It's based on out of sample forecast. So that's, uh, that's a good point. And as I hope you will agree, it's not black box once you see how it works. Finally, uh, statisticians have done a lot of work on, on this methodology, so it's not our work, but uh, there are lots of uh, theoretical results on asymptotic properties of the aggregation rules, which ensure convergence. And we'll use aggregation rules that do ensure convergence. This is a, a set of methods that have been used quite a bit in France in particular to predict electricity consumption, and uh, also for climate models and network traffic, but not uh, in economics. And when you think about aggregation in economics, you might think about the uh, very influential and interesting um, literature in econometrics. But that's what we're going to do is very different from that. Uh, in fact, uh, this type of online learning has really its origin in uh, dynamic game theory, interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, so it has, there, there's, uh, a lot of the, of the computer scientists right now who are using these, uh, of the statisticians who are working on the methodology, they, they use, for example, the papers of Mark Hart and Mascolel. I mean, it's interesting. It's, uh, so it's a completely different tradition. So how does it work? So let's go. Um, we, are doing, we are doing sequential prediction using uh, what we call expert advice. So what is uh, expert advice? Spot advice is just going to be uh, econometric models, or uh, it, could, it could be also uh, the advice from one of you here or several of you. So it could be human advice, could be anything. We, are, uh, we, are, we have a question. The question is, uh, is there going to be a, a systemic banking crisis uh, three years from now? Okay, so that's our question. 
And we're going to use econometric models and the views of uh, maybe Rafa and, uh, and Jorge or to, to kind of uh, aggregate those, those, this information containing their views and, and these models to try to predict whether indeed the answer to the question is, uh, is one or zero. So we are going to try to, to predict uh, whether there's a crisis. So we're going to make a forecast, which is called Whitey Hat. And we will receive the true answer um, at some point. Of course, we have to wait three years because to know if we are in a pre-crisis now, we have to wait three years. So there's a delayed information feedback. And depending on how well we do, we'll suffer a loss. That's going to be the distance between our forecast and the actual uh, uh, realization. So how are we combining those forecast? Well, if I um, call my expert advice the, uh, the FJTs here, uh, so that's, uh, and, and I have uh, N experts, big N capital N experts, then my forecast will be a combination uh, with weights of this, uh, of this expert advice. And the weights, the PJTs, are going to be uh, picked in a way that I'm going to describe. There are several possible strategies for that, but I will uh, walk you through one of the strategies. And using those optimal weights, I will, uh, I will uh, produce yt hat, and then I will have a loss function, which is a cumulative loss function between t equals one and cap t. My loss function of a given strategy s uh, is going to be uh, the distance between my yt hat and, uh, and yt, and I'm going to take here an Euclidean distance. It's a quadratic distance. What I do need, uh, I don't need anything about the DGP, but I need the loss function to be convex and differentiable. So that's an assumption that, that we do need. So now you're going to say, how are we going to measure the performance of this uh, aggregation rule that I'm going to use so when I'm aggregating, aggregating my experts? Since I don't know anything about the, about the underlying process. Well, um, my forecaster's performance is going to be a relative one. And uh, we are going to define this object called the regret, which is going to be the difference between my loss function and the loss function of a given expert. Okay, so that's uh, RJT here. You see that it's the, the difference between two loss functions, the loss function of, uh, of the forecaster and the loss function of a given expert, uh, the expert J here. So you can, you can interpret this regret really as a regret, is how much the forecaster regrets not having followed the advice of this particular uh, expert J. So that's why it's called the regret. We are going to minimize the regret of a given strategy S of picking the, uh, the, the, uh, the weights with respect to the best combination of, export, of experts that we know only ex post. So the regret uh, is, uh, you, so it's the difference between the, the loss function of the uh, of a forecaster and the loss function of a given uh, expert, but here we are going to take the best possible combination of experts, okay, which we will know only exposed what were the best possible combination of experts, but we're going to try to minimize ex ante the regret with respect to the best possible combination of, of, of experts that we will know exposed. And the beauty of this is that asymptotically the regret can be bounded, and the bounds in particular depend on log of n. So not in n, but in log of n. That means we can have a fair number of experts. So the regret uh, goes to zero asymptotically, even in our case of uh, delayed information. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something that is good. So you can see that it's really a, a, a very metastatistical approach in the sense that uh, if, you, if you go back to the loss function of the forecaster, it's really the sum of two terms. It's the, for, it's the sum of... Uh, uh, whatever uh, mistake the best possible combination of experts is, is doing, and the regret. So how close can I get to the best combination of experts and how well this best combination of experts do? So there's these two possible error terms. That means that I want good experts, otherwise they are going to make mistake. And then I also want to be able to go very close to them. So these are these two components, right? Which are, and it's, is a, is a combination of So the, my, my optimal, yes. So my, my optimal weights vary over time, absolutely. 
uh, but the uh, asymptotically the best combination of experts, non-exposed, that's a given set of experts. So the weights there are constant. But in my optimal weights, they vary over time. Um, okay, so uh, if we have bad experts, it won't work. We need good experts. But the garbage in, garbage out rule applies. There are different ways of picking those weights, and I'm going to use uh, a very intuitive one, which is called the exponentially weighted average aggregation rule, which actually has good results empirically, at least for, for financial crisis prediction. So that means these vectors, Ps, they are going to be uh, taken in a convex set. So they're going to be positive, some, some to one. And there is uh, a simple formula to compute them. So here is the formula. It may not look so simple, but it, it, it is intuitive, you will see. So this, this weight that I put on a given expert J, which is time varying, OK? Uh, it's going to depend on two things mainly. So the gradient of the loss function of that expert. So essentially, if that expert has pointed to the wrong direction in the past, it will be downgraded. So that's what these gradients term are telling you. But how, quick, how quickly do we uh, downgrade them? It depends on the learning rate. And the learning rate here, this eta t, is also a time varying thing, which is optimized upon. So uh, if the learning rate is high, you're going to downgrade guys quickly. If it's low, you, you just have more inertia in, in the formula. So that's the EWA. OK, so uh, it's uh, asymptotically, that's the asymptotic result. It's going to be similar for out of sample forecast, the best fixed combination of models. But you know, we, we, we learn only exposed. So we go asymptotically closer, close, as close as we can to this, uh, to this best fixed combination of model. So at least asymptotically, that means we're going to do at least as well as the best available models uh, that you might have. So this is a very uh, open source type of methodology, because if any of you, you have a great model to predict financial crisis, this is fantastic, because we can just put it in the set of models, and it will be picked with a weight close to one. So we will do at least as, as well as that model asymptotically. And in sample, it's a question, but you'll see we do uh, quite well. But that means everybody can come in. And actually, that, that's really something that across central banks, you can have complementary efforts there, because uh, people can, uh, can chip in with their own views of, uh, of what are the best models. All right. So now let's implement that, uh, that methodology. Uh, we are going to. Uh, uh, to take the Jordan, Shularik, and Taylor database. And in order to be able to implement it, we need two things. We need, uh, because, the, because in that paper, we really want to see if we can predict out of sample the Great Depression. We want to learn before the Great Depression. So for this application, we need two crises before 1929. Otherwise, we cannot learn. And we also need enough, uh, we, we, we don't like missing variables, missing, uh, missing data too much, even though there are ways of dealing with that, but here we are not. So we don't want too many missing values. So that puts us some, con some uh, constraints on which countries we are going to be able to, um, to predict here. But in the end, we end up with six countries. And the nice thing is that we have countries which are fairly dissimilar. In particular, we have the US, we have some European countries, and we have Japan. And we know that Japan is a pretty atypical case. So that's a good test of uh, whether we can do stuff generally or not here. OK. What about the uh, crisis episodes themselves? So the way we define the pre-crisis, we take it off the shelf from the same database. So we are going to predict fairly substantial crises, which are um, systemic banking crises, as defined by uh, Jordan, Shularik, and Taylor. So if it's a systemic banking crisis, if there are major bank failures, banking panics, substantial losses in the banking sector, significant recapitalization, and or significant government intervention. So that's the way they define it. And then they, they code it. And they have their uh, one zero, uh, their dummy variables, T and T, and we are going to be predicted I and T, which are the three years before. 
Right, then, now that we have the data, we have to think, and the EWA being the aggregation method, we have to think about what about the experts. So the experts, so we can take anything, as I said. Um, we have experimented quite a bit uh, in, the, in that spectrum, uh, and uh, we, we've done different things. We've also different data sets. The statisticians uh, tell us, as a strong statistical school in Stanford in particular, that some of the best models to predict uh, out of samples are logit with elastic net penalty. So that means a kind of mix of ridge and lasso penalty. So they tend to be uh, uh, models used uh, for out of sample forecast uh, because they have good properties in terms of uh, themselves not having too much overfitting and, uh, and uh, just having good uh, diagnosis. So, we go with logit with elastic net penalty for part of our experts. And what we did is that we created different themes. So we take some logit elastic net uh, model with uh, um, real economy variables, GDP, et cetera, some with uh, valuation variables, asset prices, et cetera, some with uh, external uh, indicators such as current account export imports because there are also these types of crisis, some with credit variables and some with housing market variables in order to ease the interpretation, but we don't have to, huh? it's, a, it's just something we did. And then we also allow for mix and match in terms of variables. How do we do that? Well, we uh, take a methodology which is used uh, quite a lot by doctors in health economics, which is that on the patch sample, we run some simple statistics, in that case, OROC procedures, to uh, isolate the variables that seem to have the most information about, in our case, crisis. So we run it only on the initial sample, so before the 1910s, okay? And uh, typically, we, we take the variables which have an OROC above 0.7. So what is an OROC about 0.7? An OROC is a statistic that allows you to identify the variables that predict crisis, but do not over predict them, okay? Because you can have variables that predict crisis all the time, that's not very informative. So if you are totally useless as a variable, you have an OROC of 50%, you're as good as a point cost. If you are super good, you have an OROC of one, you are perfect. And typically in health, people take variables which have an OROC of 0.7 of being quite informative. So we use also that threshold. And we take the variables with OROCs uh, above 0.7, and then we mix them and match them randomly to form other uh, logit with elastic net penalty. Plus, we throw in some machine learning models. So we throw in a, a random forest, and we throw in a, a statistical model called the GAM, okay, which allows for a lot of nonlinear interaction. So we have currently 12 experts in total, but we could have more. Uh, and we could have your experts <laughs> if you have a particular one uh, that you that you like. Great. Okay. So now, what does it look like um, in terms of implementation? So here is our sample of data. For the US, you see that uh, we are going to learn on the 1880-1913 sample, and then we are going to go out of sample online from 1914. Okay, that's enough because there are two crises there and so we have time to, to learn. France, we can even start a little bit uh, earlier. We start in 1909 and then we go out of sample. Italy, same thing. Japan, same thing. Spain a bit later. Netherlands, same thing as the other Europeans. So our out of sample uh, forecast will be from essentially the 1910s onward uh, up to 2017. Now, yes, the challenge is we have to be able to predict the Great Depression and then not predict and then predict again. Okay, and the beauty also among those countries is that if you have a country like uh, Spain, Spain happened to have also uh, a crisis in uh, 1977, which is the only one. The others didn't. Uh, and of course, Japan had a crisis in the 1990s. The others was didn't. And Japan did not have 2008, while the others did. So 
So that, but, but nobody had a crisis under Bretton Woods, essentially. Okay, so how are we doing? All right, so yes, the dates are a little bit small, but so let me tell you that here, we are looking at the US and we are looking at the whole out of sample period for the US. Uh, that means we start in the 1910s here, so everything is out of sample. We have learned already in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And what we have here, if you look at the purple, these are the dates of a systemic banking crisis, okay, the purple ones. But this is not what we want to predict. What we want to predict are the blue ones, which are the three years before the purple. Okay, so we want to predict the blue lines and what we would like is to be as close to one of the blue bars. So we want to be here, here, and here, and we want to be at zero everywhere else, including during the purple, because the crisis is different from the pre-crisis. And you see that we are doing not bad. We are doing, we are, you know, uh, positively surprised by the power of this methodology. Because uh, you see that, so here, we are not doing well. We are learning, it's very the, the beginning. So if you look at a loss function, which I will show you, uh, the loss function is, is fairly high. We are still learning. Here, we are uh, showing a, a timely increase in probability of uh, or a pre-crisis before the Great Depression out of sample. So we are picking it up. Then we should be going down to zero. We don't. We have some additional false positive here in the 1930s, um, which may be either because of our methodology, and then it may be either an error, or it may be that you know it was quite a lot of turmoil at this time, and so we are picking up some additional financial turmoil that didn't end up being uh, classified as a systemic banking crisis. We are also picking up false positive in the 1950s here. And then we are super quiet, which is uh, good news, right? We are super quiet for the Britain Woods period. But then with the savings and loans, we go back up at uh, the beginning of the 80s here. And then we calm down and then we go back up. And that's uh, 2008. And then we don't go back to zero. We have, you know, we have some false positive here from the point of view of the algorithm, but that does coincide with the uh, euro area crisis. So again, the interpretation is uh, either that we make mistake or that there's something in the data. And obviously, once we converge on, on all these things, an interesting thing is to explore in more detail errors versus uh, you know, some, some kind of financial turmoil for the false positive. So that's, that's the, the results of the US now. Uh, how do we get that, you might want to ask. And indeed, then what is interesting is to say, okay, so uh, which are the experts that actually have information? So which ones are being picked? And here the learning rate is, is fairly quick. Uh, so you see that at the very beginning, we start with essentially all our experts, uh, that's, uh, and this is before, there is the information revelation. So the weights are not moving because we have a three years delay at the beginning of the online sample where we don't know uh, anything. So we don't update. And then we start updating and you see that then different models get picked depending on whether they can predict the zeros and the ones. They have to predict both the zeros and the ones. So there's information each time there is a one or a zero which is being revealed. And this is the type of, uh, of model, so maybe so then it's hard to interpret. So let's, let's go further. Out of which these models, so who are the ones who are giving the probability increases? And you can see that the ones who are giving the probability increases, there is this kind of gray, uh, greenish one, and then the purple one with uh, things here. And then there's the false positive, which is the blue one. So we can actually ask ourselves, who are they? And so that's LC4 and that's LC2. So we can ask, what is LC4 and what is LC2? And it turns out that uh, the expert predicting the 1929 Great Depression for the US is the one that has long-term interest rate, mortgage loans to non-financial private sector, real GDP per capita, and consumer prices. So you see it's a, 
It's an aggregator of different things. It's not only credit to GDP growth or something like that. It has different things in it. And for 84 and 2008, same thing. It's an aggregator of this, this time broad money, stock prices, government expenditure, total loans to the non-financial private sector. So that's uh, the expert that tends to predict 84 and 2008. So that, that points to a broader set of variables that the typical, uh, maybe empirical paper would, uh, would find, uh, even in the, in the recent literature. Now, how are we doing in terms of diagnosis, in terms of uh, forecasting diagnosis? Well, here is our aggregation strategy. This is the average loss of the different strategies. So it's the lowest loss compared to all the possible experts. So you see that we do better than all the possible experts. Some experts do really well. LC2 does really well. Uh, some do very poorly. For the US, the foreign experts does poorly, for example. And we do better than a uniform aggregation, which is just an arithmetic average of all the experts. Okay? So we, we do better. The uniform one is, is here. It's not bad, but it's not as good as uh, our aggregation rule. Dynamically, if you look at the loss over time, you see that at the beginning, we are a little bit lost. Indeed, we, we need to learn, so we make mistakes. And then we go down, and you see that the black line is the loss of the EWH, the one which is the lowest. And some experts are, are very good, others are pretty bad. Okay. Uh, so that's what you can see. Of course, we also report uh, the traditional statistics that are reported in the forecasting literature, uh, which are the root mean square error and the OROC. And so here we compare our aggregation strategy with the best convex combination of, ex of experts, which is known ex post, and, and that's a best convex combination of experts with fixed weights okay, that you know on the whole sample and uh, the uniform aggregation rule, arithmetic. So you see here that uh, the OROC is, uh, is quite close to one, right? And it's even better, no, it, it, it's actually better for the uniform rule. So the, the OROC diagnostic is better here for this one, but uh, is uh, very close, essentially, for the three cases. And the root mean square error is better for our aggregation rule than for the other two. It's even better than the best convex combination, and that's possible because that's fixed weight versus we have variable weights on the sample. So here we have excellent diagnosis. I mean, it's way better than the literature on, on, on this. Now, you may say, okay, that's the US, and kind of something special about the US. So we are moving to France. So what does France do? Well, France has um, these two crises, so one in 1930 and one in 2008. And for France, what you see is again that we, we are false positive here, we are learning there. Then we pick up the crisis very well again, so we do the same as the US. Uh, we go down a little bit late, and we have all this false positive in the 1930s. Okay, so again, maybe have a look at the a look at the history of France in the 1930s, probably a bit shaky, uh, or it's a mistake, I don't know. Then things come down quite a bit, and then we just have a little blip here at the beginning of the 80s, uh, but not much. Um, I'm not going to say that coincides with the Mitterrand government. <laughs> I think technically it does. <laughs> I'm not going to say, not going to read anything into that. Uh, and uh, and then we have uh, the crisis of 2008, and then you see that it goes back down, but it's pretty junk. But uh, the euro area crisis was not a systemic crisis for France. So from the point of view of our algorithm, it's a, it's a mistake. So that's, that's France. So what are the guys uh, saying something here? What are the, uh, the experts? So you see that uh, for 1929, there's quite a few. So it's a bit different than the case of the US. And from 2008, we have a valuation logit, and we have also a random forest here during the time of, uh, of the um, URIA crisis. So for the 1930s, we have all these experts uh, crying wolf here. They have to do with uh, some of the real economy variables, house prices, stock prices, consumer prices, and the statistical model picks up the exchange rate here. 
And for 2008, we have short-term interest rate, long-term interest rate, stock house prices, house price. Plus, uh, after that, we have this guy. So that's uh, what comes out for France. So it's different than the US, definitely. But we've quite good uh, diagnosis again. So I'm not going to walk through all the diagnosis, but you see that fairly high OROX and fairly low again with mean square errors. All right, so now we go to Japan. Because Japan is really a, a different case. It's very, very different from many respects. For Japan, you see that we don't do well at all at the beginning of a sample. We just don't. So here we just, we just don't pick up the prequisites at the right time. And we pick up a lot of things going on in the 1930s, 40s here. And then we do calm down. And interestingly, we do pick up the 1990s crisis and not the 2008 one. So, okay, so we are kind of happy with the end of the sample. We are not uh, happy with the beginning of the sample here. Uh, and uh, so I, I need to talk a bit with, uh, with the economic historians of Japan. Uh, so my understanding is that one of the crises at the beginning of the sample is due to an earthquake. So I would, if it is the case, I wouldn't be unhappy about not picking it up. <laughs> so that, that's obviously not the type of thing that we should be picking up with this uh, methodology. But the other one is a standard banking crisis, so we, we are missing it. Uh, what happens here in the 1930s, so apparently there's war preparation and a lot of uh, consolidation in the banking sector in Japan. But again, I need to know a bit more about that. So that could explain why there is a lot of turmoil, but eventually they kind of put everything together and they want to go to war with it. So that's, uh, and, um, and there we still have fairly elevated probabilities uh, going forward here. So, okay, so, so it's well, not going as well uh, for Japan as for the others, but in the recent period, on the other hand, we do have the right timing, which I, was not a given. So I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, you see it shows up in the statistics. Your rock is now 0.74. And so no miracle. And uh, the root mean square error has increased as well. Spain. So here is Spain. And Spain, we do quite okay. I mean, we pick up uh, lots of crises here, three crises in a row. Uh, we don't go back down. So there seems to be a lot of issues also after the 1930s which are false positive. So again, I don't know exactly what happened in Spain uh, in terms of the financial stress during that period. Then we have a period of uh, relative well, quietness. And then we have 1977, that seems to, to be fairly uh, prominent here. Then we have another spike here. Um, I think the 1980s, somewhere in the middle. And then we have 2008, that we also pick up. So we don't do uh, badly, but we do have some false positive here. Uh, and what are the models? So it's going to be interesting to see in particular who gives the 1977 prizes, which is the purple one. And so the purple one is the one that has investment to GDP ratio, exports, exchange rate, and real GDP per capita. It's probably not absurd because I think the crisis was uh, pretty much balance of payment oriented at the time and linked to the real economy. But uh, there are experts in the audience that can tell me if I'm totally wrong on this one. Um, and otherwise, we have um, uh, uh, other uh, things which are linked to GDP per capita, consumption. So that's that means also quite a bit of real variables for the 1930s. So for Spain, we are okay in terms of, uh, of diagnosis. We are not as good as for the US and for France, but we are okay. And we move on to Italy, just to show that it's actually, uh, you know, we, we can do it too. So Italy, yes, but similar issues with the 1930s false positive, quiet period. Everybody gets the quiet periods right. So, okay, that's some, there's something good there. Now we also get the 1990s spike, which is also interesting. It was linked to a banking crisis more, 
more uh, serious in southern Italy, the 1990s crisis, banking crisis in Italy. So that's kind of interesting. Then it's jacked, but it goes back down. And then we go back up again uh, in 2008. So again, we don't do uh, too badly, uh, but we do have quite a few um, probability increases along the way, which might not be you know, totally uh, crazy. Um, here, so who is uh, LC1 in particular? LC1 is total loans to the non-financial private sector, narrow money, and the exchange rate. So that's what seems to be uh, predicting in particular the 1990s crisis uh, for, for Italy. Great. So uh, the last one is the Netherlands. And again, the Netherlands, <laughs> here we are very, very spiky. So I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, and um, do we have Dutch around? <laughs> Probably don't. So, uh, so there's a lot of false positives. There's again very good for the Bretton Woods period, and then we pick up 2008 again. But we do have a lot of false positives here, so we probably don't have, I would say, the best experts of the Netherlands. The valuation experts seem to be doing a lot of the job in the case of the Netherlands, which has essentially all the prices here. Okay. And um, we also have for the other crisis uh, some kind of house price coming up and uh, long-term rates in particular and CPI. So you see it's a, it's a different set of experts for uh, different countries and also at different points in time. Now, uh, there is absolutely nothing in this methodology that is about causality. It's purely about out of sample forecast. So it's just an interesting, I guess, suggestive exercise to do like I did to go back at all these uh, experts that have a big weight and are giving an, an increase in probability and to ask from economic historians and from economists of various countries, so what is the exposed narrative about that crisis? Okay, so what is it, what happened in your country in that time and what are the markets, the variables that went crazy and to try to see whether this maps into any of these, uh, of these experts which become prominent. But the methodology itself, the theory, does not give you any uh, way to make the causal link. It's, it's purely about information content, uh, absolutely. Um, so, okay, you see the Netherlands is kind of not great, uh, but from an oral criteria, it's not a disaster, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not great. It's better than Japan, but uh, not nearly as good as the other countries. So to some extent, uh, I would say uh, what we, uh, in a way, prove here is that Hainat and Hogoff are largely right. That is to say, uh, despite the fact that all these countries are very different, and also that uh, you know we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, we do manage to find information that seems to be relevant to predict systemic banking crisis in this panel of countries. So there is something there. Okay, this time is not different. Um, that also means that compared to the uh, standard early warning indicator literature, we kind of tend to improve quite a lot. And this is because essentially we pull the knowledge and, and, and it could be improved better, a lot more, because if, um, you know, if we are not wrong and if people are using this and are willing to, to give better models, and also find better aggregation techniques, because there's a lot of work by statisticians around those, uh, uh, those lines, then we can, we can get even better. And, but we are already, I think, it's pretty, I mean, we were very positively surprised by, uh, by how well already we can do with this basic EWA aggregation. Um, I think there's a lot more to be done in terms of trying to bring causality to this type of methodology, but this is a uh, really cutting edge. Susan Afey and uh, Guido Imbens and these people are thinking about issues like that. Interestingly, in the US, people don't use online learning. So this is something that we found out with my co-authors, we were very interested. This is something that was developed by uh, statisticians, mostly in Europe. Um, there is a famous book about it by uh, Cesar Bianchi and Lugosi, who are uh, Italian and Hungarian. And it's used a lot by the French statisticians, I mean, a branch of the French statisticians um, around Paris-Saclay. Uh, but in the US, uh, trying to find some uh, citations on online learning is it, it, very hard. We didn't find, except for 
uh, an Italian who is at the Boston University and a French guy who is at MIT, the computer science uh, department. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't know why, but that's uh, as a segmentation. Um, that means there's a lot of potential maybe to, to do more work. Uh, I think this can be, of course, useful for macroprudential policies, but not in a way that is automatic. You don't use you know, any rules. Uh, if you have a probability going up, doesn't mean you're automatically going to do anything. Just means that you might want to dig further in some, uh, some areas of the economy. And uh, it's not magic. So uh, there's no way the earthquake crisis, if, if it's if indeed what happened in Japan, there's no way we predict it. And if there is a system, systemic crisis coming from cyber attacks, I just don't see why we should pick that up. I mean, I just don't see it. Um, so so it's, it, it's not magic. But the endogenous buildup crisis type, I think there is something there. And that's the Heinrich and Hogo argument. OK, so I think uh, I'm not sure how I did on time. I'm probably badly. We still have time for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen. So who wants to ask questions? Okay, well, this is a really fascinating paper. I have uh, a few comments, uh, questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, the, to my surprise, the weights go to the boundary of the simplex uh, in many occasions. So, I mean, that's a bit surprising and, 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 and it leads to the obvious question. What if you allow for some short selling of experts sort of uh, going into the negative weights? I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe you, can, you, you can do better perhaps, uh, I don't know. The, 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 the second question is that, uh, I mean, I guess that if you want to use a model for macroprudential purposes, you should extend the, the sample, uh, the estimated sample, and maybe include the global financial crisis. And, uh, and then, the, mm -hmm. of course, the, the success of your paper is basically that it fails because uh, in anticipation of a crisis, macroprudential policies are implemented so that you, the model, uh, sort of the success is going to be the failure uh, in, in going forward, right? So that's uh, and, 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 and a final uh, question. Uh, why not the UK? What happened to the UK prior? I mean, no crisis uh, there. But yeah, I, I thank you very much. So all excellent questions. Uh, so just to start there with the UK, uh, there was no enough crisis. So we need two crises before we start uh, to, to go out of St. Paul for the Great Depression. Uh, and we need that, and we also need uh, that the variables, there are not too many missing uh, observations in the variables at the end of uh, 1870 and 1910. And so I, these two things were not working for the UK. It doesn't mean that we cannot do the UK, because obviously what we can also do is instead of um, trying to predict the Great Depression out of sample, we could decide that, okay, we... Uh, we just start going out of sample later and we after the Great Depression and then and then we have a lot more countries. So it's really uh, because in that paper we wanted the striking results on the Great Depression that we do it that way. But we can do it then for, for many more countries. And I have to say there's also um, a nice methodology that uh, we are learning uh, right now from statisticians, which is about sleeping experts which is about experts which don't have data all the time. And so sometimes they wake up and there's data and sometimes they don't. But okay, so this can be <laughs> implemented. So in the spirit of short research. <laughs> so yes, so uh, so we don't know if it is this business about the, the weight very quickly going to towards one, et cetera. This is not a general result. And so in other applications, uh, it may be different. And, uh, and here across countries, it's somewhat different as well. There are some times where you have more models, sometimes you have... Uh, uh, so it depends really on the property of the sample uh, and uh, the length of the, of the sample as well. And so here we have annual data and we have a fair number of, uh, of annual periods. But uh, if we had, uh, I don't know, weekly data and very, very long sample, uh, probably uh, there would be a bit more, well, I don't know, but it, it could change uh, those things. So there are aggregation strategies in which you can put negative weights. So, um, uh, and we experimented a bit uh, with those on, on a different um, data set. And they were not giving, at, for that application, they were not giving uh, as good results as the simple EWA. But it could be because we didn't have 
sample long enough or something like that. So it is possible to short experts and so to pick weights which are not in a convex set. Uh, and uh, and with which aggregation strategy works best uh, has to be tried, essentially. So uh, we don't exactly know at this stage, and I, I don't think the statistician know. It depends on the applications, but all can be tried. And it could be that it would, you know, give you great results with more data or a different sample. It could be. So that, that's entirely possible. Uh, and uh, yes, so we so so here you see we stopped in 2017. We didn't predict the crisis up to 2020, so we we, we were fine. <laughs> Um, we uh, yes, it should be updated. Um, we are this this is being updated, I think, by Roda Shurik and Taylor. So we we will run it on the new sample in two thousand ending in two thousand twenty, something like that. But more importantly, if you are going to do it uh, from a macro po uh, policy point of view, what you can do is not use necessarily that sample, but use another sample, which is quarterly data with more variables, but then you tend to start in 1980. And um, and and I think for macroprudential authorities, that would be probably more appropriate to use that. And then you can use very recent uh, quarterly data uh, and, and see, uh, so, so we experimented with that. We do have good results as well for a number of countries. Um, but now we, you know, we will need to update it constantly. And so that's a bit labor intensive. So I'm hoping that if some people are interested in uh, central banks also, they could ex actually experiment and, and see and update it uh, and so on. Um, and yes, uh, eventually if the macro financial authorities do their job properly, then uh, we won't be able to predict like that, but uh, you might hope that then if we put some policy variables, uh, we might be able to pick up the effect of policy, but then then we will probably want to go to more structural models as well. Um, but uh, yes, that's the ultimate goal to make that. Uh, but the methodologies, you know, can probably be uh, improved to take into account the effect of policy at some point. Uh, it would be it would be good to do that. Thank you very much for this presentation. And, and my comment is related to the last thing you, you were telling about, Ian, the, the second comment by, by Rafa. And maybe we can learn more from the false positives in, in your sample. Because, of course, if you success, success to identify uh, a problem in the future, uh, and the queen listen to you and act, the problem will not happen. Yes. Yeah, and so maybe this is behind these false positives be, be, before uh, Britain Woods, and we can learn from that. Yes, definitely. So, so that's also a uh, you know very good point and something that we started only uh, uh, to pay attention a little bit um, because we wanted to focus on um, on trying to get the those those probability uh, results, and so we didn't have enough time to investigate uh, those false positives in. Uh, in, in great details, but I, I, this is super interesting because it would be nice to know whether when we see these things going up, it is completely because we make a mistake, which is entirely possible, entirely possible. Either the, because we, all the, what we can investigate is whether we make a false positive because all the experts are wrong, uh, and are, are, I mean, are wrong. all the experts are, are telling us a, a false positive. So that could be one thing. Or whether our irrigation rule is not doing very well. That's the first thing this we can investigate. Then whether the experts are telling something because actually uh, there was reason that they say something, but there has been policy action or simply luck. I don't know. Yeah. This we can expose to try to find a narrative for that. And I think that's super interesting. And we haven't had time to, to dig enough into it. Uh, the only you know country where I to talk because I was concerned by the results was Japan, and uh, so uh, the uh, the Japanese economist I talked with talked to me about this uh, consolidation of the banking sector in the 1930s. But I, I really need to to have more information about uh, about that. Uh, absolutely, I think it's super fascinating, and in top of it, it's quite interesting to discuss with the economic historian. It's super super nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I was going in the same direction as well. So, uh, 
Um, and, I, and maybe the, the extension to the question is whether this, the criteria uh, is too strict at the moment because you're just focusing on the crisis that actually existed. And maybe you had these events in which both Rafa and, and Jorge pointed out something took place that prevented the crisis and maybe yes. uh, to get a better understanding on how to identify crisis, you need to pinpoint those actions as well uh, to get a, a, a better tool, probably, uh, to better the tool because mm -hmm. it's, it's good as it is. But, yeah. uh, I fully agree. I, I, I really think that the next step that we have to... Um, uh, really to to look more into it, and there would be more uh, work to be done. I'm not sure we will, you know, have the energy to do it. But one thing that could be done is um, uh, there are people who have been putting together a historical database on valuation of banks, for example, and uh, and there has been some, uh, uh, you know, what they call quite crisis. <laughs> like you see that the valuation of the banking sector is. Uh, is really uh, taking a bad term, but that's not necessarily leading to a, to a financial crisis uh, in, in that sense. And so we could go to both additional types of data and see whether there's some correlation with our false positive. Uh, so that's that's clearly something, uh, that's one possibility. But but then there's, you know, uh, indeed the policy intervention is fascinating. And, and people also try to start to work on this historically. So there's this... Uh, uh, assistant professor in uh, in BU now was postdoc at Yale, worked with Ken Rogoff, who is starting to put together a historical database of policy measures uh, from the financial system. And so I think we could draw on that as well. And I, a lot, all kinds of fascinating things uh, we could we could do. Colors, but it looks to me uh, the, the fact that um, uh, the first and the, the last part, the, the colors were pretty close in terms of which expert dominated. Uh, apparently, there was a kind of an overlapping. So I, I'm curious how different are these experts that predict the uh, later, the 1980s, uh, mm -hmm. versus those the, the very beginning? Right. Well, it's entirely dependent on the country. So uh, the experts that are um, giving a high probability of crisis in the 1930s and 2008 can be relatively similar, or they can be uh, quite different, uh, depending on the country you look at. So for example, there are some European countries in which uh, the exchange rate shows up, for example, in the, I believe in the 1930s, but doesn't necessarily show up in the in the end. Uh, there are some uh, uh, countries in which the housing market has some weight in one, but not the others, and some countries in which it has weight in both. Uh, and uh, so, so it's uh, it's it's not uh, yeah, it's not the same across countries. Um, yes, which maybe tells us something, or maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Hi, thank you. It's, it's, it's amazing, this work. Um, I was interested, I've always thought about the CCYB as being implemented like fine tuning, like not the big uh, changes from one meeting to another. But however, when you take a look at your probability, there are spikes. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see that being implemented with this fine tuning? and from one meeting to another, there's this increase in the probability. Uh, so I think the CCYB is just part of the whole tool, right? So uh, definitely if um, uh, if uh, you see a big spike in the probability of, of crisis three years ahead, I would have thought that especially if you are in a situation where things look pretty exuberant, which, you know, tends to actually be the case for this type of crisis, you would want to first of all increase, make sure your CCYB is close to the maximum of your of your range. So that would be one measure. But then you would want to take additional measures, possibly by um, uh, looking at uh, what the expert, possibly what kind of expert is uh, is screaming, and that may not be uh, you know the, the right answer. But 
at least that should tell you to look close more closely at uh, at specific uh, possible danger points, typically the real estate market, uh, and uh, looking at more granular data. And if you kind of see that uh, there is in more granular data with different types of feedback, possibly qualitative feedbacks, etc., some segments of the markets which are going crazy, then on top of having a you know more resilient banking system via the CCYB, you you definitely as a macro prudential authority then would want to take additional measures such as uh, tightening lending standards on the on the housing market, for example, that would be a typical one. Uh, but you you can think also of um, uh, it could be the consumer credit, it could be it could be other things. And uh, depending on the macro prudential authorities, they have different tools depending on the legal setup, etc. In France, we can do quite a lot of things. For example, we can uh, you know we can especially have different tools for the real estate market that we can then use uh, that tends to be the most relevant. Uh, so yes, so there are lots of things we can do. Okay, thank you very much, Helen, for this fascinating uh, presentation. No, thank you very much for all the questions.
everyone has enjoyed their coffee. Uh, now is, is our time to start the afternoon session. And which better way to start with, with Shansha? Shansha, the floor is yours. You have to turn on the, the microphone. Ah, there you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be in Montevideo. And I really, uh, really thank the organizer for having me. It's a joint paper uh, with Hans Garzwa and uh, Elo van Taden. And uh, I used the, an alternative title. The, 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 the one I gave on the program was a bit boring. But this one is... This is something you read in the press. The journalists ask you, but in the end, will the government repay its debt or not? Or is it going to borrow for, for forever? And um, we know um, from uh, macro uh, theory that the public sector, the government plus the central bank, uh, provides uh, safe assets, uh, the treasury bonds and, and money that are used by firms and households to dampen income costs. There is a, Additional literature on that, and the revenue provided by issuing those safe assets also allows the government to smooth taxes. So it's good. However, in some countries, public expenditure consistently exceeds taxes. So the, it's not the idea that you're going to uh, repay the debt when things go well and and uh, borrow more when things go badly. There are countries uh, like France, for example, where um, primary surplus has been negative consistently in the last 50 years. So is it sustainable? I don't know the situation in Uruguay, by the way, I should have checked, but I believe you are, you are much wiser than, uh, than the French. Uh, so there, there is a debate. Is it sustainable in the long run? And basically we have, we have a, and it's not specific to France, and because public debt has reached uh, uh, all times high since the global financial crisis and then the great lockdown. Uh, the, 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 the figures are above the highest peak in the past, which was the Second World War. So it's something we have never seen before in history. So the question is, is that uh, sustainable? Is this under control? And so basically to simplify the, the debate, I would say there are two views. Uh, Cochrane uh, says no. Because in the end, like private agents, government have to face an intertemporal budget constraint. So you cannot be systematically in deficit. And you have people like Blanchard who says, yes, well, maybe at least in the US, maybe not everywhere, but when interest rates are lower than GDP growth, you don't have to worry about uh, budget deficits because in the end, uh, the debt to GDP ratio uh, would go back to normal in, uh, in, uh, in time. The problem I have with this uh, reasoning is that uh, RNG are endogenous. The interest rates and the growth rate of the economy are not given, but they depend on the policy decisions, right? So for example, if public debt increases, it is likely that the interest rate will increase and that growth will decrease. Uh, and also you see there are important cross-country variations in public deficit. In Switzerland, last time they had a public deficit was probably 100 years ago. Uh, uh, so is there, is there something to explain these cross-country different, uh, differences? And maybe, and the thing we put uh, uh, forward here is the notion of political preferences. That is, there are countries which favor the corporate sector uh, at the expense of the household sector, and those countries uh, will have different behavior in terms of borrowing and in terms of growth. Okay, so basically what we do in this paper, we have a very simple general equilibrium model with, with financial frictions where a safe asset creates social value. So it's a, a simple version of uh, recent papers by Ricardo Reis and uh, Bruno Mayer et al, but much simpler. And uh, interest rates and GDP growth rates are endogenous. They are endogenously determined by fiscal policy. And the other uh, thing that we introduce is heterogeneity. We have two classes of agents. Uh, I, I could say uh, uh, capitalists and, and workers, but uh, I say households and bankers or entrepreneurs, if you like. We have the 
corporate sector, but we, we call them bankers. And the government chooses a policy that maximizes the weighted sum of the welfare of these two different classes of agents, households and bankers. And we will see that they have different interests. And so the government is going to choose a policy that um, depends on the weight that is given to the banking sector. This would be uh, the variable of interest, what we call alpha B here. And uh, alpha H, the weight is given to us all is one minus alpha B. So, so the, this would be the variable of interest. So uh, we characterize optimal fiscal policy as a function of this weight. And we show that the results are very different according to the size of this weight. There are countries that will favor the corporate sector and countries that will favor the household sector and the two which will have different uh, fiscal policies. So uh, in this presentation, there is no money. We have a companion paper where there is money instead and uh, we have a story of bank reserves and uh, this kind of things, monetary policy. But here, it's a real model, there is no money, and uh, the, the only safe assets are uh, debt, actually public and corporate debt. Also. So what are the results in a nutshell? Yes, yeah, sure. And wait may change over time, but uh, it's the extension in the internet appendix. Or well, the simple story that we have, we take the weights uh, uh, constant. But you're right, you're right. <laughs> no, no, but you're right. It's something that we can, and we can do it, but uh, you will see you lose some simplicity in the results, by that. but you're right. So anyway, what we find in this model with constant weight is that the optimum, the optimum allocation, that is the feasible allocation that maximizes the weighted sum of the welfare of households and bankers, this optimal allocation is a steady state. It's very simple. The growth rate and the interest rate are constant. And the economy grows at a, at, a, I mean, uh, at, a, at a constant rate. And of course, you would lose that if you had weight dependent, the time-dependent weights, right? And in our model, the government has a full control of these interest rates and growth rates through fiscal policy, basically uh, issuing debt and um, and taxing uh, households and and and, uh, and bankers. And the optimal RNG depends on political preferences, essentially on the bankers' welfare weight and savings. Okay, so we will see how it uh, it uh, basically the, there are two cases. When the political weight of bankers is large, when the government favors the corporate sector, or more narrowly, the, the financial sector, the, then Cochrane is right, in the sense that the optimal allocation is such that R is greater than G, and then the intertemporal budget constraint binds. So he's right. There is a, there is a, you cannot sustain a permanent fiscal deficit in this case. But there is another case where alpha B is low, that is, the government favors more the household sector rather than the banking sector or the corporate sector, then Blanchard is right. Then R is less than G, and the government can sustain a permanent deficit. You know, the world's public debt is not constrained by future surpluses. Agents. You can have a permanent deficit, and there is nothing wrong with that, yes? And th there's no chance of a default on that. No chance of default. No, 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 it repays all debt by issuing new debt. So in the second case, government debt will never be repaid, and there is nothing wrong with that. And I come back to that. Uh, and don't hesitate to, to ask questions. So the model is extremely simple. It's a simple AK model without labor. There's one physical good, the quantity KT, it's called capital, but it can be also consumed. So it's taken as a numeraire. There is no money, if you like. And there is only one financial asset, which is risk-free debt. And the risk-free debt can be issued, by, is essentially issued by the, by the government. But it could be issued by the banks as well, but it doesn't really matter. 
So it's a continuous time infinite horizon model. And as I said, there are two types of agents who have the same preferences, log utility and this exponential discounting at rate rho. And so the, the, the risks are individual in the sense that there is a continuum of bankers. And the idea is that you can, with a continuum of bankers, you get diversific full risk diversification. So each of them is indexed by a number i in 0, 1. And uh, each of them controls a risky technology. So it has its own portfolio of loans, let's say. And the firms are not modeled. The firms are passive. So it is as if the banks were invested directly in the risky technology. And the return on each banker's uh, assets is uh, um, uh, uh, parameterized by this uh, Brown and Morton, it's a, it's a idiosyncratic risk. And the thing is that they are privately observable. That is, they are not, you, you cannot observe them, you cannot track them, you cannot insure them, so they remain on the balance sheet of the individual banks. They cannot be traded or insured on the context. So if you look at the aggregate economy, by adding up the returns on individual uh, banks and, and, adding, and using the law of large numbers, you see that output GDP is, is uh, deterministic. It's purely proportional to the stock of capital. So the only stock of growth here is uh, asset investment, asset accumulation. There is no inversion force. So the government, we suppose that the government spends a constant fraction of the capital stock, which is exogenous, and finances it by taxes and bonds. And the idea is what proportion of uh, taxes and bonds is the optimal one. So bonds are real here in the sense that since there is no money, they give the right to one unit of the good at any time. So the price of a bond is always one. And the, the adjustment, supply and demand of bonds is made through the interest rate. The interest rate uh, equalizes uh, uh, demand and supply of bonds. And the government has to choose the tax rate and it chooses different tax rates on the wealth of bankers and households. But of course, it cannot tax profits. If the government could tax profits, the risk would be eliminated. If uh, the banks could uh, uh, write contracts to exchange their risk, risk would, would vanish. So here we have incomplete markets because the individual risks are not observable. So households uh, choose consumption and we, we assume that uh, they save in bank deposits, but again, they could also buy bonds. It would be uh, it would be the same. So, for simplicity, let me describe the allocation where households only invest in bank deposits, and the bankers use their, their own wealth, their equity, plus the deposits of their customers to invest in capital in, in uh, productive technology, and they also invest in government bonds. Okay, so maybe there is a balance sheet, yeah, the typical balance sheet of a bank. On the asset side, you have capital or loans, if you like, and uh, government bonds. On the liability side, you have deposits and equity. And so if you aggregate, you have exactly the, the, the same uh, equations. Everything is, is linear, if you like. And uh, the uh, um, aggregate balance sheet of our source is even simpler because they put all their wealth into deposits, okay? <laughs> so if you aggregate the balance sheet of the banks and the balance sheet of the household, you have the balance sheet of the private sector. And since we are in the closed economy, this is fundamental, the government will play on the structure of the balance sheet of the private sector by issuing more debt or less debt. It will have an influence on the balance sheet of the private sector. Okay. So it turns out that uh, returns are constant. So everything is proportional to the stock of capital, which is a given, which the government cannot change. And so it's uh, much simpler to, to measure everything in terms of bank equity. That is, we divide the aggregate balance sheet by the uh, aggregate amount of bank equity. It doesn't really matter how much each bank has. What matters is the aggregate bank equity. And so you have this very simple normalized balance sheet of the private sector. We have divided everything by the equity of banks. So on the asset side, 
you have what I call bank leverage. So there are many different ways to define leverage, but here I define it as the ratio of risky assets over equity, X, XT, that's the bank leverage. And the other thing, the other, there is another, we need only impact two uh, parameters to represent the state of the economy, XT, bank leverage, and either HT, which is the ratio of household wealth over bank wealth, which is a kind of inequality measure, the way the total wealth is allocated between the two categories of people, or alternatively, the debt to GDP ratio. Because the debt to GDP ratio delta T is the total amount of public debt divided by GDP. And if we use the balance sheet equation, you find that it's a very simple function of HT and XT. So I will choose XT and HT, but I could have cho chosen XT and delta T. Okay, so now we solve. I don't want to bother you uh, with the detail, but it's a log utility maximization, so it's extremely simple. There is a constant propensity to consume of the wealth, which is all, both for the bankers and for the households. They, they consume at each day a fractional row of their wealth. And the bank leverage is determined by a Merton type of portfolio choice, where basically the bankers compare the return on their risky technology, mu, an average and sigma uh, the, the volatility, and the safe return on uh, bonds, on government bonds. And basically they choose a leverage, which is the ratio of the excess return, uh, expected excess return, mu minus RT, divided by the square volatility of, of, the, uh, of the risky assets. Okay, so it's a very simple equation. All the banks choose the same return, the same uh, leverage. And so there is a simple equilibrium on the capital market since KT is given, ET is given. So for a given, at a given time, XT is given and it determines the interest rate. The interest rate is determined by bank leverage. It's a linear, linearly decreasing uh, function of bank leverage. And similarly, we, since the only source of growth is investment, so investment is the output minus consumption. And if you divide by KT, this is the rate of growth. So this is the output, the expected return on assets, minus government expenditure, minus the consumption of the bankers and the household sector. If you add up the two, you find a very simple expression where the growth rate of the economy is equal to what I call chi star, which is the growth rate that would happen in an economy without friction, uh, with, uh, and you subtract the term that is proportional to the debt to GDP ratio. So we have this very simple property that the growth rate is a decreasing, a linearly decreasing function of the debt to GDP ratio. Okay. Because I want to do political economy. You mean, you mean inside the bankers? Yeah. Because you, are, you, you need to have idiosyncratic risks. If there was a single banker, the risk would vanish and uh, everything. It would be a different model. It would be a model of macro risk. Here it's the model of idiosyncratic risks. And public debt is a safe asset that banks use to buffer their gains or losses. Okay. So if, if there was only one bank, this wouldn't have happened. No more questions? Yes. Yes, it would be similar, but I prefer that banks choose their own portfolios rather than, uh, if, otherwise it would be too mechanical in a sense. Here yeah, they compete, they, they choose their optimal investments. Anyway, so the equilibrium, the dynamic equilibrium can be described by two state variables, bank leverage, debt to GDP ratio delta T, or alternatively, the ratio inequality ratio HT. And we have very simple dynamics for these two variables. Uh, which come from the budget constraints of the household and the bank. For example, for the for the households, this is the interest rate they get on their savings. This is how much they spend, and this is the tax rate. 
how much they do. And the tax rate would be negative in some cases. There would be a subsidy to households. And similarly for banks, uh, it's the same short term. The return on the risk on the risk free asset minus wo minus the tax rate. But the bankers remember they invest in risk assets, so they have a, a premium. They get risk, they take risks, and therefore they're remunerated for that. And uh, at the optimum, this is sigma x squared. So once the government chooses the tax rate, pH tau H C and tau P C, it controls completely the dynamics of the economy. So instead of having an infinite horizon, very complicated equilibrium model, we have a very simple model where you choose the tax rate or alternatively uh, the two variables H and X. So it's much simpler. Especially if you want to compute welfare. Welfare is a simple function. Welfare is essentially the expectation of the discounted utilities of consumption. And so it's a simple function of these two uh, safe variables, xt and ht, and uh, homogeneity is really used here to simplify the model. And uh, I, I don't want to bother you about uh, the detail, maybe the formula is a bit ugly, but uh, the thing that uh, is remarkable is that if the government really wants to maximize in a consistent way, you know, you have to have commitments by the government, and if the government wants to maximize the intertemporal welfare the weighted sum of the intertemporal welfare of the banks and the households, then it's on that that this thing is stationary. The same, and it has to do with exponential discounting also. The, basically, the, one, the government wants to put the economy in a steady state, so the economy stays there forever and grows at a constant rate, and the interest rate is constant. It is given by the, just the maximization of this expression with respect to HT and XT. The formulas are extremely simple. Uh, I don't want to comment on them, but let me just point out that the ratio of, the, of H over X is entirely determined by the weight. And similarly, the X, which is the bank leverage, is determined both by the weight of bankers in the welfare function, but also by this ratio, sigma square over rho, which is a kind of measure of uh, the trade-off between risk and uh, postponing consumption and um, and um, preference uh, time preference, if you like. If people are impatient, then it's more difficult to uh, uh, to provide the appropriate level of, of incentive, if you like. Okay. The the the, the important thing is that uh, <laughs> for each alpha b, let's say, we have one couple of optimal allocation, H and X, a stationary steady state. And for any level of uh, HB, sorry, a, a, alpha B, the optimal debt is positive. And the, the thing can be viewed very easily. Uh, if you eliminate alpha B, that is you replace uh, H over X by, uh, sorry, you replace alpha B by one minus H over X, you have a cubic equation, and after doing some simple manipulation, you find this. You find that the optimal debt to GDP, and it's not exactly debt to GDP, it's debt to capital ratio, is positive. So it's always optimal to have a positive level of debt. When sigma square equals zero, when there are no frictions, no risk, or alternatively, if the risk can be eliminated by diversification, if markets are complete, it's the same. In this case, government debt is useless. And you don't want to, the government to be in debt. Sigma is the volatility of individual idiosyncratic risks, if you like. And so there are two cases in which sigma equals zero. One is when there is no risk, and the other is when this risk can be diversified completely by complete markets. But because we don't have complete markets, then uh, it, the, the thing matters. And in particular, it's easy to, to interpret that as a buffer against shock. Each bank holds treasuries in order to decrease its exposure to individual to idiosyncratic trust. They cannot be diversified, but they can be dampened or absorbed by having this uh, risk free asset. So the constraint Pareto frontier can be easily determined by uh, letting alpha b vary from alpha to zero or expressing 
it has a function of, uh, of x, delta, the debt to GDP ratio as a function of x. And remember, we can compute the growth rate and the interest rate once we have x and h. And so we, we have an expression of the optimal interest rate and the optimal growth rate, depending on alpha d, the weights given to bankers by the government, okay? So first thing to, to note is that x, the leverage of the bank, is a decreasing function of alpha d. The more weight you give to the banking sector, the more uh, insurance the government wants to provide to the banking sector by decreasing uh, this, uh, this leverage. Okay. When uh, x is higher, which is e, either because k is lower or e is greater, the banks are less exposed to this, uh, to this risk. And if you remember, g is a decreasing function of the debt to GDP ratio, R is a decreasing function of X. If you put that together, you have a very simple condition which gives you uh, G greater than R, if and only if uh, this step to GDP ratio is less than, so it, uh, it, it looks complicated, but in fact, very simple because of the monotonicity of X with respect to alpha B. The main result is that in the optimal steady state, G is greater than R, if and only if the weight of the banks is small enough. Okay, so there are two cases. So this is the representation of the Pareto frontier in, the, in, this, uh, in this economy. With a, so it's the constrained Pareto frontier because of this uh, um, incomplete market. Um, so the um, by to optima represented on this uh, inverse u shaped curve. And there is a threshold because the condition R uh, equal to G is a, is a straight line here. And so there are two regimes. When you are on the left part of the Pareto curve, which means that alpha B is locked, put a lot of weight on the banking sector or corporate sector. Then it's optimal to choose a point somewhere here, such that R is greater than G. And the extreme case you do in, in which you give all the weight to the bankers is represented here. And there is another region where alpha B is small. You give a lot of weight to the households rather than the bankers. And then it's the opposite. R is smaller than G. So I call that the Cochrane case and the Blanchard case. Um, now, oh, doesn't show very well, sorry. Um, this is a representation of the optimal debt to GDP ratio. And surprisingly, it's not monotonic. Well, in fact, it's essentially constant for slightly decreasing, so the, 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 um, the variables that you cannot see uh, on the horizontal axis is the weight alpha B of the bankers. So if the bankers have a very little weight uh, and you, 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 you start increasing it, then the, the optimal debt to GDP ratio increases, and then after that, it's almost flat. Okay. Now, Ponzi schemes and internal for budget constraints. So there is a lot of... Um, talking about uh, uh, the sustainability of public debt, but uh, I, I like uh, simple mathematics. So I will, uh, instead of talking, I will do simple mathematics and I hope you will follow me. So there is a budget constraint of the government at day two, which is the increased P dot on public debt as to correspond to the interest rate paid on existing debt plus government expenditures minus taxes. And so another way to say that is the interest expenditure minus the primary surplus. Primary surplus being the difference between tax receipts and, and expenditures. So I can integrate that between zero and capital T, the simple math. Right? So I have the value of public debt today at date zero is just the integral of the primary so discounted primary surplus from zero to T plus a residual term 
which is simply the discounted value of future debt. Okay? So the traditional exercise is to, so I represent that as a kind of balance sheet of the private the public sector. The balance sheet of the private the public sector, you have liabilities and public debt, and on, on the assets, you have the future tax receipts or the surpluses, and you have this term. I will comment about this term, which is essentially the capacity to borrow again in the future. Okay, so now when P goes to infinity, there are two cases. One is when R is greater than G, so it's a Cochrane case. Remember that the economy grows at the rate G. So BT, the, the, the debt of the economy, of the public sector, the public debt, increases at rate G. So if R is greater than G, if you discount that at rate R, this goes to zero. Kind of, sometimes it's called a transversality condition, but it has nothing to do with the transversality condition. So in this case, if I take P equal infinity, I have a very simple expression. The value P0, of, the current value of that is just the integral of future primary surpluses up to the end of time. Okay, but there is another case. The, the Blanchard case where R is less than G. In, in this case, P goes to, this term goes to infinity. As G is greater than R. This term is fixed. So the only possibility is that this term is equal to minus infinity. So it's not very informative. You have plus infinity minus infinity equals B0. You don't learn a lot from that. But my interpretation is that I prefer to have a, a, a finite capital P because I think it makes sense. And what is the capacity for the government to borrow? It depends on two things. It depends on the fiscal revenue, the capacity to extract fiscal revenue. But there is another term here, which I call the goodwill of the government. The, the capacity to convince investors that the economy will grow at the rate G larger than R forever. So if the investors are convinced that the economy is well run and that the government can indeed stimulate growth up to the end of time, there is nothing wrong with having a consistent deficit, fiscal deficit, because there is always this capacity. So it has nothing to do with the transversality condition or anything like that. It's just the fact that the investors, and it's, it's really the uh, Ponzi scheme. Right? Uh, I know that uh, there will be people who will uh, lend to the government in the future. So there's nothing wrong with having a constant fiscal deficit, especially if it can sustain a high growth rate. Yes. Yes, I know the, in one or my year at all, they have uh, all kinds of, uh, they call that mining the bubble. It's a very, a very nice uh, expression, mining the bubble. But I, I, I don't know, uh, it, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, because the people uh, are risk averse. So if you want to come, well, I mean, but it's probably, you, you could probably write a formula saying that it's the value created by public debt, something like that. Yes, I think you can. But uh, I prefer simple accounting uh, equations. There is no, there is no, uh, no debate about that. But it's true cool that it's the inference value in some way. Okay, so conclusion. We have a very simple macro model with frictions and heterogeneous agents. And specifically, you have classes of agents, the household sector and the banking sector. <laughs> the government can control interest rates and growth rates through the fiscal policy, basically playing on the on the tax rates on banks and households, and uh, it determines the level of debt. The second best optima are steady states that are easy to characterize as a function of the wealth flow rate. And we have two cases when the banker's rate is large, or is greater than G, it's the Cochrane case. Fiscal surplus has to be positive, otherwise you cannot sustain debt. And the value of that is the present value of future surplusing. When on the opposite banker's weight is small, then R is smaller than G, and the government optimally runs upon this scheme. So Madoff went to jail for doing that, but the treasury is perfectly entitled to do that. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Jean Charles. Uh, we have time for questions. 
Very oh, interesting. It's very, uh, it's, it's very elegant and it's uh, very amusing to see Cochrane and Russia side by side, I have to admit. <laughs> Um, so I have two types of uh, questions for that. So one type is, uh, so yes, you are assuming, um, it's, one type is about, you know, what determines R. Okay? So you are assuming here it's all the supply and demands of the public debt. Yes. Okay, so in practice, um, practice we know that the interest rate, uh, the real rate, here we are talking about real rate because the, uh, Together, uh, down together, and up together in uh, all the countries, essentially. Um, so you 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 want an open economy? Is so, that right? No, no, no. But uh, but so that that points to determinants which have to do with uh, possibly other trends. Um, I'm going to enumerate the number of things that people have described that um, possible drivers of the real rate, from demographics to product yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. financial cycle. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so that's one one type of thing. So. Uh, which uh, so then is going to have some effect on you know. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Macro. So essentially, it goes also to the fact that uh, there is macro risk practice. Okay. Uh, and uh, and and in fact, all if you look at all the bumps in debt to GDP that you have shown us, um, these were macro shocks. These were wars. Essentially, these were great financial crises. These were pandemics. Uh, so there's an issue of how to map that. No, no, the, the, so, absolutely right. So, you're absolutely right. So that's but, one set of comments. I, I mean, uh, and I can back. No, no, but uh, you're absolutely right. The point of our paper is to clarify that the discussion about R greater than G or the opposite has some political economy dimension. That it depends on the way the government favors the corporate sector versus the household sector. That's all we we are perfectly aware that the model misses many things. We are currently working on an open economy version of the model, and the results are a bit different. But I agree with you that we should add macro risk as well, and uh, it would change you know, the, 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 the the optimum would be more complicated. It would be. A, Macro steady state in the sense that it would depend on macro shocks. But uh, the point we really is the political economy of R greater than G. Uh, that's, uh, that's the thing. We we'll also break the simple correlation between uh, debt to GDP and growth. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. We'll have I mean, you know, I want, I want simple models in, in the sense, simple ideas, and then we can elaborate. Uh, but you're right, you're right. And then I'm, I'm assuming it's what you're doing in your attention. Yes. So uh, when there's the uh, data pool budget constraints, so there would be a second term, which would be linked to valuation effects on the debt, yes. which there would be a lot more complicated because that could also be linked to the duration of the debt yes. and, uh, yes, and right. whatever monetary policy and price stickiness. No, 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 I agree with you. No, no, sure. So that other valuation term could actually be quantitatively uh, Quite important. The, the thing we miss for the for the complete model with money and bonds is the uh, so there are two kinds of safe assets and what determines the uh, choice of uh, households and firms for one versus the other. So you have to introduce some transaction value of, of money and this and we are still struggling with that. I mean, your your I mean, your focus is on steady states. Or I mean, if you start from the wrong level of debt, uh, you can work out the transition to the steady so state. So the, the thing we did, we did it's a linear model, right? So the transition is immediate, in the sense that you jump immediately if you start with different debt to GDP ratios. The government has a power to tax and redistribute in such a way that you immediately reach the target. And after that, you only use uh, local uh, instantaneous tax rates to keep the economy in that. Now, why do you call them banks? <laughs> well, uh, in the new version of the paper, we call them firms. It's it agents that run a risky technology that they are risk You call them entrepreneurs. It's a corporate sector, I would say, basically. And also, we're working on a kind of extension but there will be two layers 
we will have the banks distributing credit to the, the firms. And so it would be more complicated because you would have several state variables. You would have the, the equity ratio of the banks, you would have the equity ratio of the firms. And um, I mean, it would be more complicated. But for the moment, the simplest possible uh, thing, you can interpret our banks as entrepreneurs, if you prefer, it's the same, except that now the deposits are replaced by corporate debt. So in the entrepreneur version, which in fact we like better, but uh, I, I thought it was easy to present the bank version. In the corporate version, you have one risk-free asset, which is perfectly, it could be corporate debt or government debt is the same. And the firms, they borrow from the households and they invest in a uh, government. So you can you can look at the crowding out effect of these kind of things. When the government tries to uh, borrow more, it has an impact on corporate debt, et cetera, et cetera. And, and one suggestion in your inverted view graph, it would be nice to plot the social indifference curves for different values of the alpha B. So you could see how changes in the alpha B map into different points in that inverted U. Yeah, we, we have that in the, in the paper. We do that also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shanshar. We now move on to the next paper. We have Umberto. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to close out the first day of this workshop. And uh, I promise not to take too long so we can all go watch the Brazil game. Um, so what I, when all this project started, my interest, um, I want to understand what are the possible limits to uh, the provision of liquidity, the government's provision of liquidity during uh, market turmoils or during crisis. And to set expect expectations correct, in this paper, what I do, I, I study what are the motives um, beh behind foreign reserve accumulation by some governments. And I argue that fiscal capacity has a lot to say about it. So it's related to what John Charles was just talking about. So it's perfect in this way. Right? Specifically, I'm interested in um, discussing why governments accumulate foreign reserves with the purpose of providing a uh, lender, of, lender of last resort type policies, that is uh, liquidity exposed. You know? At the end, I hope that I can show you that by studying the special case of foreign reserve accumulation, we can uh, extrapolate some general lessons that could be uh, applicable to more, much larger, larger contexts regarding what are the limits of public uh, liquidity approach. Okay, so let me start just by showing you, this is a well-known uh, stylized fact in international market. This figure graphs the stock of foreign reserves in control of uh, monetary authorities across the world. This is data from the World Bank, and this is, goes from 1970 to 2020. And what we see and what has caught the attention of the literature has been this spike 
or the buildup uh, since the 2000s. Since the two between 2000 and 2020, uh, the value of the stock of foreign reserves has more than doubled, going from approximately 6% of, of GDP to 14% of GDP. <laughs> now, there's a large strain in the literature that argues that part of this buildup has been driven by governments that learned the lessons of the 80s and 90s uh, financial crisis. That is, they seek to uh, self-protect themselves against the volatility of capital flows and therefore reduce the exposure and the negative effects of potential sudden stops to their economies. However, if you think about this idea of governments accumulating uh, liquidity ex ante, this goes, um, this, according to Einford's interpretation, uh, of course, is at odds with the uh, baseline liquidity framework from Homster and Tiroli. In this framework, governments are a special animal. And why is that? Because they have uh, credible governments, of course. They have the exclusive right to tax. This gives them the ability to produce liquidity at will. And specifically during crisis, they can manage crisis because they can transfer liquidity between illiquid agents and liquid agents by using their right to tax, specifically when markets cannot do them on their own. Now, which what this means is that governments, in comparison to private agents, should not, uh, should not hoard or accumulate liquidity ex ante. But what foreign reserves are is precisely that. It is governments that are accumulating some resources to use them during times of crisis. So this suggests that there is a friction in public liquidity that I intend to exploit to understand what are the limits of uh, or, or what are the limits limits of what governments can do during um, market distress. What is more interesting is that this friction in public liquidity is binding in some countries and others not. What we have here is the same graph that I showed you before, but this is broken down by the left by groups of level of development of countries. The green line, the bottom line, the solid line, are advanced economies, while the dotted line are uh, emerging markets and low-income countries. This is excluding China. And you can, you can break down the overall time series in many ways, and you're going to see this heterogeneous um, accumulation of foreign reserves, which precisely, I argue, suggests that this friction is binding in some places and others not. Yes. Uh, the uh, large advanced economies, they all have swap lines from the Fed. So if they had not the swap lines, maybe you could see the same uh, uh, rationale also playing out here, which would strengthen your point, you know. That, that is true. You're talking about the swap lines, right? Okay, the problem is up. Yes, but I'm not sure if that uh, all of them, I know some of them were available during Bretton Woods. I'm not sure if they entered in inter interim period until the great financial crisis that were also available. But at the end, I just want to suggest that uh, there's some heterogeneous uh, accumulation of foreign reserves. Not every country is accumulating foreign reserves. So what I do in this paper, I precisely ask the question is, why do some governments hold reserves while others do not? As I mentioned, as with the purpose to act as lender of last resorts. And to do so, I construct a theoretical framework based on this liquidity framework of a small open economy that borrows from international markets. And I introduce a friction, which I borrow a concept called from the development and taxation literature called fiscal capacity. And at the end, I hope to show that this, this framework that's, that I'm using can be used to provide general lessons about the limits of public liquidity provision. So what is, what is this friction of fiscal capacity? Now, fiscal capacity, as I mentioned before, is a, a concept that is, uh, has been studied by uh, Beasley in person and people who work on taxation and development. And to put it in simple words, is basically given the, tax, the existing tax structure and the tax system, as well as the power of enforcement, enforcement of a government, how much revenue can the, this government potentially raise? Now, the idea behind this is that if you think about, let's say there's one country has $100 of tax revenue and another country has the same uh, 
hundred dollars of tax revenue. It is not the same if one, it, it is not the same if one country collects these uh, resources through income tax versus the other country that could collect the same amount of resources through tariffs. And the reason for this is because so more sophisticated tax systems allow this government or provides this government with access to a greater share of uh, economic activity. Basically, what I'm saying is that this, uh, this last quotation is that what, by widening or by strengthening your tax system, that you can increase the access of resources that a government can, access, can have access to and extract resources from. What is important is that to increase fiscal capacity, a government or a country has to make some important investments in both in the monitoring, administration, and compliance of the taxes, tax system. And these are, uh, this basically means that some governments have done it, where other, other go governments have not, not done it or have been unwilling to do so. And why is this idea of fiscal capacity important? If we assume that private markets uh, are characterized by financial frictions, which create a gap between borrowers, borrowers and lenders, specifically, they, they create a friction where borrowers have, uh, they, there's a friction between what they produce and what they can credibly press, uh, promise outsiders or foreign investors. Then at the end, the question is, is tax collection subject to the same financial frictions that characterizes these uh, private markets? And the answer that, that, um, that I'm providing in this, in this paper is that it, well, it all depends on a country's fiscal capacity. When a government has low fiscal capacity, its tax uh, revenue system is going to be subject to the same financial frictions that characterize private markets Whereas if it has high fiscal capacity, it's able to overcome those existing financial frictions. I'm gonna have three main takeaways that I, uh, that I, that I wanna transmit. The first one is that I find that there's a nonlinear relationship between fiscal capacity and reserves. That is countries that have high fiscal capacity as well as countries that have low fiscal capacity do not accumulate reserves. Only the countries that have middle levels or medium levels of fiscal capacity do so. And what this means for, for in terms of public liquidity is that governments with high fiscal capacity are those that are considered in the whole trend at all framework, which means that they can provide the public liquidity at will. They can rescue their economies and market turmoils. Now, governments with medium fiscal capacity they can also protect their economies, but they can only do so at the cost of accumulating reserves ex ante. So in order to emulate or copy those countries with high fiscal capacity, they, tend to, they have to make this preemptive investment in foreign reserves. And there's a, the countries, governments with low fiscal capacity that actually have the amount of fiscal capacity is so low that the amount of resources that they would need to uh, invest preemptively is too high, and therefore they are willing to remain exposed and actually do not have sufficient uh, public liquidity capacity to protect their economies from uh, sudden stops. So therefore they have an ineffective public, public liquidity. Now, the second idea that I want to transmit is that the total amount of liquidity that in an economy as a whole can attract is going to depend on how much it can credibly promise foreign lenders. Now, therefore, government intervention is only going to be welfare improving if it manages to increase the amount of credible, um, credible return that it could promise foreign lenders, and that's going to depend on fiscal capacity and on its tax system. This means that a government that has low fiscal capacity, and if it intervenes, but it doesn't manage to extend or expand the frontier of pledgeable income, it's, it's only going to crowd out uh, the, what the private sector already is offering. So it's, I find that there's this liquidity crowding out effect when uh, governments have low fiscal capacity. And the third uh, takeaway that I want to transmit is that 
fiscal capacity is not the same as fiscal space. So the key idea, once again, is not the amount of resources that uh, a government can borrow, it's exactly what is, what is backing up, what type of um, return is backing up those uh, bonds that the government is issuing. Is it the same return that is already, already being, being promised by the private sector? Or actually, if it has higher fiscal capacity, can it add new returns that can increase the pledgeable income that an economy can offer. So as I show by the end that fiscal capacity is not the same as fiscal space. Please feel free to interrupt. So I'm going to go over, uh, I don't know, Gerardo, are you keeping time? If you let me know when 10 minutes, maybe. <laughs> So uh, first we'll go through the theoretical framework, then I'm going to show you the empirical evidence where I'm able to sustain the implications of the theoretical uh, framework for a sample of 68 countries between 1991 and 2016. And then I'm going to try to wrap it up again and show you why this can be used to uh, understand or, or give some lessons of, on general lessons of public liquidity provision. Now, the theoretical framework is also is simple. It's a three-period model of a small open economy. This economy, in this, in this world, there's only one tradable good that is used to consume and invest. And this economy is, uh, is uh, inhabited by banking entrepreneurs, <laughs> just to address your concerns right away. Uh, these banking entrepreneurs are risk neutral, but these, uh, these have access to this investment technology technologies, this investment technology that is constant to uh, return to scale. And what this investment technology consists of is that it has some um, bank entrepreneurs have to make an initial investment, which is the investment scale. Let me see if I can, okay. Which is the investment scale in the first period. Then this um, project produces a safe return on the intermediate period that is proportional to the initial investment scale. And these projects, if they want to continue and generate the long run return, they need to, there needs to be made a reinvestment in this project. Now, this reinvestment that I'm going to denote by J is going to be the key, the key of the model. If can a entrepreneur or an economy finance or cover that reinvestment? At the end, as I mentioned before, it's going to make if some reinvestment is made, there's a long run return that it's equal to or denoted by uh, P1. Now, how do bankers uh, cover both the initial investment and the reinvestment? So they, they have this initial endowment that is uh, denoted A. They also can save some share of this safe cash. Uh, that the project generates for and save it for T1. But as well, they can sell real claims both in, uh, at, in international markets, both in the initial period and in intermediate period. Now, international markets, funding costs are driven by a global financial cycle where the uncertainty comes that uh, there's, a, with probably alpha, Find, uh, the goal, the international markets are going to be under a boom in the intermediate periods, that is low funding costs, or with probability one minus alpha, international markets are going to be under duress, under a market stress where we're going to observe high uh, funding costs. Now, the friction that is, that is commonly introduced is some, some type of model hazard, and here, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the banker at the start of the, uh, the final period can abscond or can run away with the share of the, of the long run project. This means that what can be credibly pledged to foreign investors is going to be this P0 that is lower than the total, uh, the total um, return that the project generates. And the additional assumption that I'm going to make is that Financing costs during the boom are lower than the than what can be credibly promised to outside investors. However, during market stress, what can be credibly promised is lower than the uh, funding costs that uh, that are required to borrow in international markets. This means that if an, a banker wants to 
attract resources during a market stress is going is going to need to provide some resources of its own so foreign investors are willing to uh, be part of the uh, reinvestment now how i model this public liquidity provision is let's think about of a lender of last resort that has a fiscal capacity denoted by this parameter mu it is between 0 and 1 and the idea is that, uh, well, giving some resources or, or tax revenue that this lender of last resort wants to collect, it can collect up to share mu of that tax revenue, regardless of the entrepreneur absconds or not. So basically, if we think that the entrepreneur in the private relationship with foreign lenders is running away, then the government, if it has made the investments, for instance, in uh, income tax rate, it can actually do better than private agents, and it can actually have some access to those resources, to the resources with which uh, this uh, entrepreneur has run away. And that is uh, the amount that it has access is, is this. It's just a fraction of tax revenue, right? And this means that this is... This fraction is actually share is a, is the share of new pledgeable income because this is income that's actually not contractable or it's uh, is limited within the financial frictions. Uh, the, yeah. So T is going to be determined by the amount of debt that is going to be issued. Dish. Okay. So to continue with John Charles' comment. So this lender of last resort wants to minimize the liquidation of price. Let's think about, let's say that this economy, that investment and reinvestment that bankers uh, is actually hiring people. So therefore the government wants to minimize the amount of unemployment in this economy. So they want to make sure that the reinvestment is as closest as the initial scale of the project as possible. And to do so, it provides in times in times of need, it can provide a transfer to these banking entrepreneurs that is financed either through debt, selling real claims in international markets with a G, or by using foreign reserves. Now, th the difference between these two sources of liquidity is that foreign reserves need, need to be preemptively accumulated from period zero, whereas uh, debt needs to be fully repaid in the last period. So therefore, the amount of debt that can be issued determines uh, the amount of taxes that need to be collected. Does that answer your question? Okay. So I'm going to focus, of course, in a equilibrium, perfect foresight equilibrium, where the entrepreneurs do not uh, abscond, where they actually, if they have any claims, they pay them back. So let's let's think about the continuation equilibrium, and let's think about the uncertainty of this model lies in the intermediate period, whether the global financial cycle is in a boom or is in a market stress. Now, at that moment, the state of the economy is described basically by the I, which is which is the investment initial scale, but actually it's also uh, the demand for liquidity of this economy. It is it's also described by the amount of resources, private resources that have been saved uh, by entrepreneurs to address potential uh, market distress, the amount of uh, reserves that the government has, and whether we are in a boom or whether we are in a market stress. Of course, this is all giving. Um, the, the other argument is what is the fiscal capacity of the lender's last resort that inhabits this, uh, this, this economy, right? So, in any, regardless of whether I'm in a, a low state or a high state of the financial cycle, the amount of liquidity of, the, of reinvestment that I can make is going to depend on the amount of resources that I saved previously, this economy, whether private sector or the government, and the amount of resources that can attract by selling claims to foreign markets. Now, of course, these the amount of resources that I can attract from foreign markets are going to be limited by the total amount of resources that this economy produces, which is this is the conditional solvency, basically. But also the amount of, um, of pledgeable income that this economy produces. What is interesting here is that while B is limited by the pledgeable income, 
only a fraction one minus mu of uh, private or sorry, our public liquidity is going to be limited by pledgeable income. And therefore, if you think about this mu as being one, which is basically a government with full fiscal capacity, the only limit on public on public debt is going to be the solvency constraint. This goes away, and the only limit is going to be the solvency constraint. Whereas, if you think about the other extreme case, with mu is equal to zero, then actually the limit for both private and um, public debt, the external liabilities of the this economy, are going to be limited by pledgeable income. And therefore, this mu determines how much of this public debt is bounded by this uh, constraint. Yes. Why did buy the So actually, it, it, it's, if you take a look at the model, it does because uh, the resources that the private actor has are going to depend on how much of that pi i is going to be allocated to the project and therefore to this, sorry, this A. And how much is, are going to be already uh, uh, promised to foreign investors. Some some share of that safe cash flow goes to foreign investors. Some some of that stays, and it's actually this day. Okay. Now, if you take this constraint and you take this sorry this equality, you take this constraint, then you're going to have this binding well not binding this liquidity constraint for the economy as a whole, which suggests that what can potentially bind the amount of resources that an economy can borrow and the intermediate period is going to be potentially bounded by the amount of resources private uh, that both private and public have, say, preempted. What is interesting, and there we're, we're going to see, is that our assumption for when the economy, the global financial cycle is under a boom, is that this ratio is going to be negative because we are assuming that rho is greater than the cost of funding when there's a boom, and therefore this constraint is not going to bind. In that case, when the constraint is not binding, then actually all of the reinvestment can be done through borrowing, and there's no need for this economy to accumulate preemptively uh, resource, either through the private sector or through the public sector. Okay. Now, this, this, is going to, this constraint is going to, uh, I'm going to go slow. How much time do I have left? Sorry. Yeah. 11 minutes. Okay, that's right. I'm going to go uh, through different cases and scenarios of this constraint. I'm going to show you the different potential set of equilibria depending on what we think. So let's start with the less apparent equilibrium. We have this constraint. If we think that there's no government intervention, so what is up? And we're going to focus on what's, what's the amount that a, a government, a bank entrepreneur, can borrow during a market stress without uh, public liquidity approach. Now, this, this constraint suggests that the amount of borrowing that it can do is going to be limited by the amount of resources that it saves, right? So therefore, if it will only be able to continue during a market stress if it saves sufficient resources, et cetera. What is, what is the trade-off? in the initial period. Well, the trade-off is that the benefits of, uh, of saving those resources is that is comes with an expected value. Right? It is possible that if we end up in a boom financial cycle, then those that investment is not going to produce any benefit because it wouldn't need those resources to continue. And therefore, the, while the cost on the investment scale is certain, the benefit only comes with a probability. And because of this, this idea, what we have in equilibrium is that this, this bank entrepreneur is only going to be willing to save those resources if the probability of the market stress is sufficiently high. And that's what we have here on the right. We have here on the uh, vertical axis, the probability of a market stress. And here we're going to have uh, the fiscal capacity of the government. But for the case of the less fair equilibrium, we have two possible equilibria, which one is the no crisis equilibrium, where it's characterized by a 
uh, set of parameters where the, this economy is going to be able to continue even during market stress because bank, bankers themselves uh, save the necessary resources to continue during our market stress. However, when the probability of this market stress is sufficiently low, we're going to be in a sudden stop equilibrium, which is basically showing that if the market stress is realized, then this economy is not able, not going to be able to invest because it didn't save sufficient resources to continue forward. Mm -hmm. That is the simple idea. Now, the idea is, can government intervention improve this set of equilibria? Can we actually, can the government intervention reduce uh, the area of the sudden stop? If we think about, okay, let's think about now of the same uh, liquidity constraint with no reserves equilibrium, just by intervening. And remember that by intervening, there's this, uh, there's this effect that the government has because of its fiscal capacity. What happens? So now what we have, where we have this constraint is that now there's another way that this economy can borrow from abroad. And instead, and notice that the cost of, uh, of borrowing is going to be uh, affected by the fiscal capacity of, uh, of the government. And therefore, even if this uh, cost of funding is greater than, than to the pledgeable income, here in this ratio, there's going to be levels where for fiscal capacity, when it's sufficiently close to one, this ratio is still going to be negative. So for levels for fiscal capacity that is sufficiently high, this uh, constraint is not going to bind. And we're going to have another set of equilibrium compared to the lesser pair, which is this threshold is precisely where this ratio is equal to zero, this mu is equal to well, this numerator is equal to zero. And if the fiscal capacity is greater than this uh, threshold, then we're, we're in a place that market, uh, that government intervention, intervention between private entrepreneurs and international markets actually eliminates the financial friction. It overcomes and it completes the market, you know, uh, so to speak, right? However, when the fiscal capacity is lower, we're going to have... Uh, both, again, the no crisis equilibrium as we had before and the sudden stop equilibrium. However, the difference is that before we had this straight line and now this line is going to be uh, uh, decreasing. And the reason why this line is going to be decreasing is that because the, fiscal, the amount of resources that a bank bankers need to uh, save as fiscal capacity increases is gonna, gonna be lower. The amount of resources that they need to compensate in order to attract resources with government intervention is going to be lower. And therefore they will be willing to ensure themselves to lower probability events. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see that as fiscal capacity increases, then the area of no crisis equilibrium where private agents themselves ensure themselves it, it increases the area increase. And so this is just to show you that fiscal capacity itself has already an effect uh, on the exposure that an economy has to southern stuff. Now, can a government do even better? Can we sh show or can it actually improve or reduce the area of southern stuff's equity? Now, if we include the, the possibility that governments uh, save some resources through uh, foreign reserves, now we have additional resources. What do we have? So I'm thinking of a, prob a simple problem where a lender of last resort want wants to minimize the opportunity cost of, use of having those resources diverted from this project technolo technology, technology and being saved by the government plus the benefits of, uh, of guaranteeing the continuation of product. What we have here is a loss function, where is the greatest value is a decreasing loss function, where the greatest value of this loss function is when there is no uh, reinvestment, that is where J is equal to zero, whereas this, this loss function is going to be zero when J reaches full-scale reinvestment. 
Now, at the end, what are we going to have is that when we solve this problem, is that even though this constraint is binding, by accumulating resources, either through the private sector or the public sector, this economy could potentially uh, provide or attract the liquidity it needs to uh, to eliminate eliminate sudden stops. Right? And what we see here is that by solving that problem, we again have the mature equilibrium, which is basically no need for reserves. The no crisis equilibrium, which is again that the private sector is self-insuring, is self-insuring. The sudden stop equilibrium again. And we have an additional uh, equilibrium, which is called the reserves equilibrium, which is basically that in this area of, of the state space, what the government is choosing to accumulate the necessary resources through foreign reserves to guarantee the continuation of, uh, of projects or to minimize the liquidation of, um, of projects in this economy. Yes. These foreign reserves come from taxing the bankers and they do. Yes. Yes. But that's nothing to do with the <laughs> Actually, that's a very, very good uh, comment. And um, I'm working. So the model itself assumes that this comes from taxing. However, and therefore, that, that is why I have this uh, reduced form like cost of accumulating reserves, this idea. However, if you include fiscal capacity also in this ability, well, actually, if you, I'm talking about fiscal capacity. How much of this initial endowment does the government actually see, right? So can it actually tax that or not? So I'm working on a on a, on a, on a version of the model where it actually is borrowing and can borrow to attract, to accumulate those foreign reserves. And therefore I can actually provide some better insight or to complete your comment, I can introduce this idea of fiscal capacity also in the process of accumulating reserves. So, Again, what we see here is that governments with low fiscal capacity are able to protect their economies from sudden stop by accumulating reserves, even if they don't have the sufficient fiscal capacity. In a way, they're copying or emulating uh, the capacity of more developed governments by uh, saving those resources. What is interesting is that in this constraint, it doesn't matter who saves the resources either private sector or the government. And therefore there's an area where there's at least two equilibria which coincide, which is basically this no crisis equilibrium or this reserves equilibrium. Of course, there should be more equilibria where there's a mixture of the total amount of resources that need to be set. So at the end, what do we see? What do we see is that in equilibrium, um, as I, as I interpret the existence of uh, reserve accumulation is that they indicate that there is a binding funding liquidity constraint. So they are compensating for the lack of, uh, of governments to be able to borrow due to their lack of fiscal capacity. Now, in terms of the demand for reserves, what we see is that um, governments with high fiscal capacity do not accumulate reserves in equilibrium because they don't need to. And also we see governments with low fiscal capacity that don't accumulate reserves as well. However, the reason for that is that the, for these, uh, these, uh, these governments, the amount of resources that they would need to accumulate is too expensive. And therefore they are willing to remain exposed and fragile to sudden stops. Finally, let me just finish with this comment is that I argued that there's a uh, fiscal capacity is not the same as fiscal space. And to see this, we're there are two restric restrictions to external liabilities in this economy, right? The external liabilities of this economy are given by private sector borrowing and public sector borrowing. First is the solvency constraint, and next is the uh, pledgeability constraint. If you separate this effect, you can argue that the fiscal space is given by, is given by this inequality that basic, basically is saying that the amount of resources that uh, that a government can borrow is just a share of total of total respective product, and this is how usually fiscal capacity is is modeled, like the upper bound on on tax revenue. 
However, if you think about, there's also this way of writing, well, rewriting this, you can also see does this crowding out effect, which is basically that as B or public government liquidity increases, the amount of pledgeable income that is left for private uh, liquidity uh, falls, all depending on the fiscal capacity of the government. If you separate for a second, consider two different mu's, one for fiscal space and one for, for crowding down effect, I show that this is the result that we had, but I show that if you consider that the government has full fiscal space, but only limited, uh, well, the, this crowding out effect exists, you have an area where there's a potential or welfare improving role for reserves. Whereas if you consider the opposite, whereas there's no crowding out effect, effect but it, there's a limited fiscal space, then actually there's no area for the need to accumulate reserves. And once again, this highlights that the need for reserves comes from whether or not the government has the ability to increase pledgeable income of this economy by intermediate. Uh, yes, so I have um, empirical evidence to support the two implications of, of the paper. I'm not going to show that because I'm getting looks free from Gerardo. Uh, but let me just finish by saying that, uh, what I think this paper overall says is that private, from Hofstra to Joel's work and others, of course, private liquidity is limited by pledgeable income. No? So the argument is that public liquidity is successful in their intervention as long as it's able to uh, create or bring to the table new pledgeable income. And therefore, if it, if it is not able to do so, then it can compensate by accumulating resources ex ante, right? This, what does this mean? It means that no new, no new liquidity is created at the expense of illiquid agents. If this is important for emerging economies. Let's, for instance, uh, I'm from Colombia. So let's think about Colombia, where most of the tax base is, uh, is comprised by firms. So if the firms are the liquid agents during a crisis, and the government wants to provide liquidity at the expense of increasing future taxes, then the amount of total liquidity that is actually going to produce is not going to uh, is not going to increase as as one would think, precisely because you are hurting the people who who are in need of the liquidity in its uh, in first place. So that's where there's an argument that you need to extend the tax base to include other agents such as consumers and other sectors. Right? And at the end, the comment is that fiscal capacity is an important is important for the liquidity, uh, the capacity to provide liquidity during a crisis. Tax structure, tax base composition is important. And since this is fiscal capacity, not fiscal space, uh, this is more focuses on the ability to gain resources and to capture resources, and not the ability to control expenses. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. Now it's time for questions. Uh, I, I am going to introduce my privilege as a regulator, uh, which is what central banks do anyhow. So. And do the first one. So if Guillermo Calvo was here, yes. he, uh, he will tell you, well, uh, um, countries accumulate reserves to back up the, the, the assets they have in domestic currencies. So uh, they, they, you can explain the trend you, you showed in the initial uh, graph uh, by the, the growth of domestic uh, financial markets. So in, in the, as uh, emerging countries need to develop uh, domestic uh, markets, uh, they need to accumulate reserves to cover for that. What is your story here to explain that, that figure as well? So the theoretical framework is focused, uh, as you saw, is not a framework of a, there's no two, there's no tradables and non-tradables. This is not a story about exchange rate or polarization or, or international liquidity, some common, well, some concepts that have been used in research. However, the empirical exercise built on the existing literature that tries to estimate uh, well, the low risk behind that increase and includes uh, the concerns about oh, the percentage of short-term debt in foreign currencies and also the level of development of the economy itself. What I do is I build on that. I include proxies for fiscal capacity, and I show that even when you include these other motives behind foreign reserve accumulation, fiscal capacity still has something to say. 
So that would be my first comment. My second comment, when you go back to uh, uh, Calvo, is that he has a book that is uh, Macroeconomics in Time of Liquidity, Liquidity Crisis, where he talks about this concept of liquidity deflation, where there's some limits to the amount of liquidity that a government can produce. And if it goes beyond this threshold, uh, it's actually potentially can actually reduce the, the amount of liquidity that there's in the economy. I believe that this, this crowding out effect that I find in my model is um, suggestive that in fact, or is related to this idea of liquidity deflation by, by you know, kind of, I don't know if, if that can sort of, basically what I'm saying is, the theoretical model doesn't address those concerns, but I do that in the empirical model, focusing more on, on a specific channel of performance of the commission. Thank you, Marito. Yes, good talk. Uh, I have a comment related to yours and related to uh, Rafael's previous comments. So I'd also recommend you to look at this extension where uh, you, um, as a government, don't uh, at date zero tax the uh, domestic sector to accumulate the reserves. Uh, and the way I'm thinking about it is from the Swedish perspective, because Sweden is a high fiscal capacity country, right, with a low government debt. Uh, and uh, still, we have a quite substantial currency reserve, and the reason is that we, as a small country, don't have a swap line agreement, and uh, we might be excluded uh, from uh, the effects market for some time, so we have to insure against that, right? Uh, and the, the way we do it is that uh, the government, and there's an arrangement between the Riks Bank and the National Debt Office. The National Debt Office is issuing U.S. dollar-denominated debt, uh, and we are basically purchasing liquid assets. Uh, and that's the way we do the research. Comment on the, um, the the fact that in practice the foreign reserves are, are held by the central bank. The central bank can issue can print money or issue uh, reserves, and there is an exchange rate. So uh, how how would this feature change your conclusions in the sense that you have two instruments and you have an additional uh, variable. So. so one of the comments sometimes I get uh, is related to this and for instance about the independence of central banks. So in my model, um, I'm not assuming, I well, for simplicity, I assume that I'm talking about a general government. However, it's not key for my results that uh, that a government controls the foreign reserves. The government that has the fiscal capacity controls the, the, the foreign reserves. Let me put it this way. Let's think about a central bank separate from a government. If, if the government has limited fiscal capacity, it can only uh, supply liquidity up to a point. Now, if the central bank is concerned of, about financial stability, economic outlook during a crisis, then it would need to com complement or, com uh, well, it need to complement, that's the correct word, uh, the lack of fiscal capacity that the government is having to provide that uh, liquidity. So the only I, the only idea for for my results to carry through is that this uh, independent central bank would also be um, uh, concerned about the liquidation of projects. Now, in terms of 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 whether or not uh, central banks can print money, well, of course, this is a real mo uh, model, and this idea of printing money. Um, it is. It is behind. It is well behind uh, the reason why people think about lenders of last resort being the the central bank. However, what is truly necessary is that this lender of last resort is able to provide the resources quickly. Right. That doesn't mean that it needs to print them. It also could do so theoretically by setting up contingent credit lines with uh, for foreign investors. My argument is that for those contingent credit lines to be able to be a possibility, there has to be this fiscal capacity to back it up, of course. That that in, in times of crisis, the, the lender of the sword has to be able to promise credibly some resources in the future, and only does that if it has fiscal capacity. The Ronald for the role of foreign reserves in your uh, setup is to deal with uh, shocks to the cost of foreign borrowing, right? The interest rate uh, going up, right? Yes. Now, um, 
So in principle, uh, this is not to deal with uh, domestic uh, kind of shocks. But I think that, I mean, think of um, shocks to the pie, the short-term return. Now, that would probably be essentially the same kind of situation. Now, you have fewer resources to deal with the reinvestment, and then uh, you resort to the foreign reserves to deal with that. Is it it? Uh, uh, a possible extension of your uh, story about foreign reserves? So you said pie, right? To the, the safe cash flow. Yes. Yes. So if there's a shock to the savings of the, the economy, basically. Uh, yes, I think, I think the story holds. At the end, what we have here is in times of crisis, whatever the, the external or why, why it happens, what can the government do? Right? And, and if it's credible, this government, and if it can provide sufficient pledgeable income, then it will not need to hold reserves. However, to address that shock, the government itself could, could have some resources saved abroad, which, which an interesting extension would be why does do these resources need to be foreign assets? Why can it not save resources from the same economy? Maybe this is related to what you're saying, because that shock on pie could be, let's say the government saved those resources through a pie for itself. Then, uh, well, maybe there's in that shock, those resources will no longer be available. Therefore, there's there's a need, or maybe a potential need for those resources to be uh, held abroad. So to protect against those idiosyncratic risks. Yeah. yeah, I guess my question is a bit similar. It's a way, in a way, restating a bit, I think. Um, so if it is only a liquidity shock, right, and if it is, uh, has to do with, uh, you know, domestic uh, uh, currency, then, you know, you have a lender of last resort in your central bank. There is no issue. It's Pure liquidity shock provided domestic liquidity and and that's it. Yeah. There's no issue on fiscal or whatever if it's purely liquidity. The issue and the reason there are foreign reserves is that we cannot print dollars. Essentially, most countries can't print dollars. Mm -hmm. Only one country which can. <laughs> and and so that's where you know the uh, foreign reserves are, have something to do with the extent in which you are indebted in dollars. There's uh, currency mismatch, or uh, or maybe you are pegging your currency and you have to defend the peg, et cetera. So these are all the empirical dimensions which usually uh, determine mm. uh, the amount of currency uh, of reserves holdings. And uh, in terms of uh, who gets the swap lines, which are a substitute to some extent for currency reserves without necessarily the cost of the, the opportunity cost of holding them. So that's highly desirable. Then there's definitely only mature uh, economies tend to get it, but there's also a geopolitical dimension. Yeah. Et so, uh, and the People's Bank of China <laughs> is extended swap lines to other countries according to other geopolitical features. So, but it's all about the use of the RMB in one case, the use of the dollar in the other. So, so, I, so that's the thing I'm, I'm having trouble to, you know, of what course. You call liquidity. <laughs> For me, it has to be liquidity in a certain currency. That's where the key element is. So a um, couple of comments on that. I'm not arguing that this uh, motive behind reserve accumulation uh, eliminates the other. I'm just, I believe that this, this paper adds an, an, another reason why a government should accumulate foreign reserves. The second one is, uh, yes, while it is true that governments, uh, well, Central banks cannot print dollars. That doesn't mean that they couldn't have quick access to them. For example, besides this, uh, the central bank swap lines, we also have the flex flexible credit lines of the IMF. And what I'm arguing is that for to have access to to those uh, sources of quick funding, you need to have uh, well, you would be better if you have fiscal capacity. Now, what also happens, for instance, with the IMF? Countries that don't have uh, sufficiently developed fiscal capacity 
it, they tend to show to get those lines of credit. They tend to show high levels of foreign reserves as well in a way to compensate for the lack of fiscal capacity. Uh, so yes, I agree. I agree with you. This is this is generally has been uh, understood as a problem of currencies. I'm focusing on this channel where it's mostly about the ability to attract resources. And my comment is, well, you don't. If you could actually attract those resources quickly, and I'm saying that depends on your fiscal capacity, then you wouldn't have uh, uh, foreign reserves. Regardless, if those resources that you attract are in dollars or in another currency, right? So is this ability to borrow quickly that depends on the uh, fiscal capacity? Any more questions? Well, thank you, Umberto. Thank you. And we resume tomorrow morning. Yes. Any uh, announcements, Jorge? Yeah, thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, Jean Charles. Thank you, Umberto. And thank you all for uh, this uh, day presentations and, and discussion. Uh, uh, let's see tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, directly in the restaurant, which is in a walking distance from the hotel for dinner. I, I hope you, you are prepared to, to enjoy meat, which is one of our uh, best seller products, <laughs> to say that. So 8 p.m. directly in, 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 the, in the restaurant. Now there is a transfer waiting for you to bring you back uh, to the hotel just on time for uh, Lucas to to watch uh, the, 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 his team uh, beating Korea, I hope. <laughs> so thank you very much. See you tomorrow. <laughs>